So good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Smile on My Canada info session here in Kelowna. So uh, I just would like to tell you before I start that uh, we will have a question and answer period at the end of each uh, presentation. So please uh, keep your question and uh, we will have a microphone that will go around the table for you. And people online, uh, you can send out your question as they come and we will, we will ask them to the uh, speaker at uh, the end of every session. So that's it for the, for the <laughs> question and answer session. There's a table in front. If you would like to uh, have our booklet, we do have uh, several uh, booklet with information on myeloma. Those are for patients and they are free, they are for you. So help yourself at the break and, and take whatever you need. And if you need more, do not hesitate to uh, get in touch with us. So we'll, we'll be pleased to send you more information. So for those of you who don't know Myeloma Canada, we are a patient-focused organization uh, committed to improve the quality of life of all Canadians living with myeloma and their families through education, support, awareness, advocacy and research, and ultimately to finding a cure for this disease. This is our biggest wish, and I know this is your wish too. The vision of Myeloma Canada is a world where myeloma is no longer a fatal disease, so I'm sure you all share this vision with us. And we have a set of values that, we, uh, that are uh, used in uh, our day-to-day -day life working with you patient, with the myeloma community. So those are the driver of our work uh, at Myeloma Canada. So we are uh, the only pan-Canadian organization, as you know, who is devoted to myeloma uh, only. Uh, this organization has been founded back in 2005 by two patients, Aldo Del Col and Jean Lemieux. And we work with uh, over 20 support groups across the country uh, and hundreds of volunteers. We'd like to be the one-shop uh, store for information, support for patient and caregiver. And an important part of our work is advocacy. So we advocate for drug and for health system in Canada, in each and every province and on a federal level. Last year, maybe some of you have heard of it. We did a Pan-Canadian consultation. We visit 14 cities. We've met with a patient and caregiver and their families to get to know what the needs were in order to develop a strategic plan. So we did that last year, and we developed the strategic plan for 2015-2018 with the board of director, and we have four uh, main strategic direction. First, uh, first one is about communication. So we try to communicate better with patient. We try to reach out to patient that don't have access to uh, all the conference that may happen in, in large city. So this is why today we're webcasting the info session. So all patients across the country can access to this information. We will have two great speaker uh, Cindy Manchulenko, and Dr. who is a nurse from uh, Vancouver uh, General Hospital. She works in the transplant unit, so maybe some of you already know her. And Dr. Kevin Song, who is a physician with an oncologist working at the Vancouver General Hospital as well. So all Canadian will access to this information today, and they will be able to ask their question as well. The second one is funding. We need to better fund this organization to deliver uh, our mission to deliver objectives. So this is something that we are working really hard on too. Uh, also the research, and uh, you will heard later on about the research effort at Myeloma Canada, but uh, I can tell you that this is something that we do really believe in, and we will put all the effort and the resources to make sure we will support the advancement of research in Canada. And the fourth one is support, and support patient through education, through awareness, through advocacy, and through support group as well. Uh, something that came out the, uh, the uh, Pan-Canadian consultation is to set up a patient advisory council. And the role of this uh, patient advisory council is to advise the board of director 
on the specific issues in, in different regions. So we have decided to set up this board and those people have been, uh, have been elected, I can, I can say it that way, uh, to represent the patient of their uh, own region. So David McMullen, a patient from Hamilton, is the chair of this committee. Uh, Julie Salzman from Atlantic Canada, uh, representing Atlantic Canada. Hervé Benoit representing Quebec. Uh, Eve McDowell representing Ontario. And fr from Western Canada, we have Laurelie Dalrymple. She's in Edmonton, but you can reach to her. Uh, you can find her email address, <coughs> I'm sorry, on our website. And you can, reach her, you can reach out to her if ever you have any question, comment, anything that you would like to share with her about the work of Myeloma Canada, she's there for you. And she will communicate all your comment to the board of director. So we work with four pillars at Maloma Canada. First one is advocacy. Uh, well, it's not an order of importance. Advocacy, education, awareness, science, and research. Under advocacy, as I said, it is an important component of our work. Uh, and we, we would like to have all your input whenever a drug uh, is either about to be uh, approved by Health Canada or uh, to be recommended for reimbursement by PCODER, PCODER, which is the Pan-Canadian Oncology Drug Review. Well, we would, we would reach out to you and we will ask you about your input uh, on this drug. So what is your experience as a patient? Have you experienced the drug? What is your journey with myeloma? What are the symptoms? How does disease affect your day-to-day -day life, your social life, your family? So we need to know this information to write the patient submission and to tell those decision maker how important this drug might be for you for the future of a myeloma patient. So you will receive uh, once in a while surveys and we will ask you about a specific drug. So those are type of, uh, uh, those are the submission we have done before. So we've done one for Velcade in Ontario for, um, for induction treatment. So prior to, you, to the uh, stem cell transplant, it was a treatment that was not reimbursed in Ontario. So we did a submission for the Ontario government and we received a positive recommendation and the drug is now reimbursed for this use in Ontario. We did one for uh, lenalidomide, which is Revlimid, uh, for maintenance treatment. Uh, we got uh, 619 respondents for this, uh, for this uh, submission, which was at this time the highest number of respondents for a peak holder submission. Um, and it was filed in April, and we did receive a positive recommendation. And also, we do have for this drug a PCPA agreement. PCPA is the Pan-Canadian uh, Pan Pharmaceutical Alliance, and those, those, uh, uh, this group actually uh, get together all the provinces, and they will, they will negotiate with the pharma company the best price for drugs. So they work to lower the price of the drug, negotiating all together as a Canadian, uh, as a Canadian organization for all the provinces. We also did a, a submission for Pomalis, so some of you may have used this drug already, pomalidomide. Uh, <clears throat> we received 40, uh, 406 uh, respondents. We tap into our U.S. Uh, partner uh, because we didn't have that much patient in Canada that had used the drug at this time, so we, we, we went to our U.S. partner, IMF, and they, they support us with the survey. Uh, we did receive a positive recommendation as well in July 2014 from PC Coder. There's a price agreement uh, with PCPA, and the drug is listed in all provinces in, in Canada except for Quebec. We, uh, I've talk, I will talk about this later on. We did uh, some advocacy work uh, on this uh, last week. Uh, we did another one for Revlimid for newly diagnosed patients. So I don't know if you're aware, but some patient may not be eligible for a transplant for many different reasons. But Revlimid as, a, as being a second line transpl uh, treatment was not available for those, for those patients. So now uh, we, we've, uh, we've done the, the submission 713 respondent, which is fantastic. Thank you to all the myeloma uh, community in Canada for your participation in this. 
And um, so, so there was a, an initial positive recommendation from Picoder on October uh, 1st, and this drug will then become available for first-line uh, treatment, so for patients who are not uh, stem cell transplant eligible. We've also done a, um, a uh, phone uh, interview, a survey through phone interview with uh, six patients in Canada. We wanted to know what was the, uh, the need, the unmet need for refractory and relapsed myeloma. And we did send a letter to uh, Health Canada uh, and the objective behind that was to inform them on what was the need of the patient, what were the needs of the patient, and how they should they should look at the new drug that were uh, filed in uh, before approval. So this was another advocacy uh, initiative. You've heard I said that uh, Pomalis is not listed in Quebec. So last year. Uh, we went to Ontario legislature to uh, Queen's Park because we thought that, okay, we, we will try to bring awareness of those people on the importance of listing Pomalis in Ontario because we do believe that if Ontario uh, start uh, the march and, and uh, list Pomalis, that will be a, a good sign to other provinces. So we went there and we, we've met with many ministers and, and uh, MPs and uh, guess what? Ontario was the first province to list Pomalist early uh, 2015. So we've decided to do the same thing in Quebec because Quebec was way behind listing uh, oncology drug and Pomalist is still not listed. So we've, we went there last, uh, last week. We've met with the Minister of Health. You can see on our website, we did issue a press release on that. We had a very uh, good and positive and constructive meeting with Minister of Health. And there was a few issues there, and I will briefly uh, go over this, but one of them was that the Minister of Health would, uh, because Quebec has now joined the PCPA, which was not the case until uh, two months ago, and the Minister of Health in this new law uh, can suspend the um, one drug from the uh, reimbursement program. So we thought it was not fair for oncology patient. And, and he did uh, commit himself and says that no way, never an oncology drug will be suspend from this program. So that was a good win for us because for our patient, they won't, uh, they won't be left behind during the negotiation of a, of a new drug by, by PC. CPA. And we had uh, many other discussion as well. But just, just to let you know that whenever there's an issue in one province, we're there. We're there to meet with the decision maker. We're there to advocate in your name, in the name of all Canadian patients living with myeloma. So this is a picture of the, 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 the man uh, uh, at the right of the screen is the Minister of Health of Canada and team of Myeloma Canada patient uh, who, who met with him. Uh, we also have, every year we hold a, um, a, an advocacy summit. So we get together people from all the country who are uh, involved in advocacy in their own province and we kind of try, train them for a full day of uh, what's going on in the reimbursement field in Canada, what will be the issue and what we should work on for the coming years. So this was held on October 30th in Winnipeg, Manitoba. We also have a team award, uh, which is, uh, has been named in the memory of uh, Carolyn Henry, who was very involved uh, in the right of myeloma patient. And this is to highlight the effort of patients uh, on the advocacy field uh, in their own uh, province or, or city. What's going on actually on advocacy? We, uh, you've, you've may have heard of Kyprolis, Calfizomid. This is a drug that has not been uh, approved by Health Canada yet, but it's coming. So we've sent out a survey. Uh, oh, sorry, there's a typo there. Uh, the survey was online from uh, September 16, 2015 until October 7. Uh, we got uh, almost 600 respondents. And uh, we will send out a submission to um, Picoder. We're just waiting for the pharma company to send its, its, uh, its uh, submission. So we're, we're ready to go for this one. And we're also working on daratumumab. Daratumumab, it's another new molecule uh, with 
Dr. Song, I'm sure, will talk about, so I won't get into this uh, science stuff. But this one will be filed uh, to Health Canada shortly. So we, for the first time, Myeloma Canada will send a patient submission to uh, Health Canada. So I'm asking you today, if, if you know people who had used um, who are using daratumumab, please get in touch with me. We need as much input as we can from patients who have used the drug because it's a Health Canada submission and we want to make sure we, we, we will have a robust uh, submission for Health Canada. So get in touch with me. My email address is there. You can go on our website. All the information is uh, on the website. <clears throat> Under education, each year we hold a national conference in a different city. So one year it's in Western Canada, the other year, year it's in Eastern Canada. Last one was in Halifax, Nova Scotia on May 22nd, 23rd, and 2016 conference will be held uh, in Montreal on May 14 and 15. Uh, we've held diff many info sessions uh, in 2015, so sessions like we have today with doctors and nurse and pharmacists and social worker that come and talk with patients. So we've had one in April with Dr. Song and Cindy Manchulenko, so those are, are really uh, <laughs> volunteer for those uh, type of session. We've had one in Victoria. Uh, I was there with Aldo Del Col, who is the uh, chair of the Science and Research Committee and the co-founder of Myeloma Canada. Uh, we had one on May 12 with Dr. Vincent Rajkumar uh, and Dr. Ali McCurdy. Dr. Rajkumar, for your information, is the doctor from Mayo Clinic in the US. So he came, he, he, he traveled to Canada only for us for the CENFO session, so we're really privileged. Uh, Dr. Ali McCurdy, she's uh, from uh, Ottawa General Hospital. We had another one on May 13 with Dr. Raj Kumar in Montreal, and this one was webcast. That was our first one webcast. We were very happy uh, to, to, uh, to share this information with all patients that couldn't attend. We had 78 people uh, through webcast. And today we have this, uh, this other info session with Dr. Song and, and Cindy Manchulenko, and it is webcast again. Uh, we also hold, uh, held a, um, a uh, support group leader summit on October 31st and November 1st in Winnipeg, Manitoba. It was the second one. So we would gather together every year all the support group leader, and I will talk about the support group later on, but uh, Ron, uh, say a, a, a few words on that. So all the support group leader and the co-leader get together in a city, and we have two days of training, information, sharing, and, and, and discussing together on how we could better, we could improve uh, our, our support group and the way the, the meeting are, are done and so on. So this is an important training opportunity for all the support group leaders in Canada. And also, if you're not uh, registered yet, we do have a monthly newsletter. Next one will come up uh, next week, so you still have time to go to our website and to register to receive in your email our monthly newsletter. So the support group in Canada. We have 20 or so, so far, and Ran Sari has volunteered to, uh, to found a new group here in Kelowna. So we are really uh, grateful for that. Uh, thank you very much, Ron. And for those of you who would like to participate into this group, I really encourage you because this is really, um, th this help a lot patient and family just to, to, to be informed, to share your journey with this disease because being alone with that could be really hard. But when you start sharing and you start learning more about new drugs, about new, new research, about what's coming up, it's really uh, helping and it gives hope to everyone, and I won't get into that, but there are research that says that people who, who, who participate into support group have a better journey with, with the disease, but this is something else, we'll talk about this later on. So Ron Sari is here with us, so I encourage you to go and meet with him at the break and leave him your name and your coordinate and he will reach out to you for the first uh, support group meeting that will be uh, I don't know when, <laughs> but uh, I, I really encourage you to participate into this, um, this group. 
We do have a uh, brochure and booklets, so those are on the table. As I said, please have one, and uh, you need more copy. Do not hesitate to get in touch with us. We do a lot of awareness too, so we have a website. If you haven't visited it yet, it's myloma.ca, so as simple as this. So you go there, plenty of information, all the support group are listed, uh, you, can, you can download our, our booklet as well if you, if you wanna see them quickly. Uh, we do have a Facebook page. Uh, there's a, uh, and I, I invite you to stay tuned because this Monday, next Monday, we will launch a social media campaign, and this will be done through Facebook and Twitter and all the social media. And this is an awareness campaign really for myeloma and, and for myeloma patient. And we do have a Twitter account as well, so if you want to follow us on those, on those media. And I haven't put it there, but we have also a LinkedIn uh, account, so for those of you who are more into LinkedIn, you can find the information as well on LinkedIn. Uh, every year we hold a march in, very, in, in many cities across the country, and this year was a fantastic year, so you can see there all the, the cities that participated in the total amount of money, uh, of money um, collected, over $400,000, uh, with only volunteer people, people that organized the, the march and walk and, and bring their, their families. So this is a day not only to, to raise money, but also to get together as a myeloma community and to share and, and to bring awareness on this disease because we had a great media coverage, local media coverage. So it is an important day for all, all uh, the, the, the myeloma community in Canada. So uh, if ever you want to start a march, you're welcome next year. Get in touch with us and we'll, we'll support uh, all the initiative. Whoops, science and research, sorry for that. Transfer from one, one computer to the other. So under science and research, I told you that it was an important component for us um, we do have a research grant that we're giving every year. It's $120,000 that we're giving to a team of research in Canada. It's a joint grant with the Cancer Research Society. We also have an award that we're giving to a nurse that is an outstanding myeloma nurse. So I'm inviting you to uh, stay tuned. We will launch soon the uh, registration uh, period for the, um, for if you, want a, uh, if you want to register your nurse for this award. And it, it, those nurses are really important, and I, I know you, you know that, but they are there for you. They are there to, ask, to, to answer your question. They are the ones that, that follow you with this disease. So we believe that it's important to recognize the work of the nurse. So I invite you to uh, send us the candidate of, of your nurse when the, um, when the, uh, the register time will, will uh, start. We also hold a scientific roundtable every year in Montreal. It's a meeting of all the physicians that works in, in uh, myeloma in Canada. So they all get together, they talk about their research, and they meet with also pharma company to, to, to share their uh, research and to get to know what is in the pipeline and what, what's coming up. So th this is the only time that all those doctors get together and talk about their, their research. So it's, it's an important event, uh, and I think this year we had over 70 people in Montreal to to uh, to to get to get to to attend this um, who attend this uh, scientific roundtable. We also have put up a, what we call Myeloma Canada Research uh, Network. Uh, it is a network of 16 academic centers across the country that will bring new. Uh, clinical trial to patient in Canada. So those molecules that we wouldn't have access because pharma company wouldn't come to Canada to do clinical trial, those uh, gr this group of uh, physician from 16 Center got together and they will they will write protocol and they will bring those those clinical trial for you for for the benefit of Canadian patients. So this is something really important that is coming up, and. Just a few words on, on what could be even more interesting for, for the, the patient in Canada. We are, um, we've wrote a, 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 a proposal, a grant proposal uh, for what we call the SPORE grant, which is a CIHR, uh, CIHR Canadian Institute of Res for Research and Health. 
and uh, we are one of the 20 finalists uh, that may receive a grant of $12.5 million to do clinical trial in Canada, to do research in Canada. So this is fantastic. This will benefit directly to patients. And not only that, because to be, uh, to be a, in the, <laughs> To be into this um, this list of finalists, we needed to um, to get money from private uh, company as well. So we needed to match each dollar that will be will come from the grant. So we did match it. So if ever we receive this grant, means that 25 million dollar will be available in Canada for clinical trial for research for myeloma patient. So this is something that I will leave uh, maybe to, uh, to Cindy and Dr. Song. They are involved, both involved in this, uh, in this um, network, but uh, please stay tuned. We should have the answer in, uh, for the grant in February, but even if we don't have the grant, this network is there and they work together to bring new clinical trial in Canada for the benefit of myeloma patient. So that's it for me. I, I invite you, as I said, to, to talk with Ron at the, at the break or at the end of the session. And if you don't have any questions, I, uh, I will leave it to uh, Cindy Manchulenko, who is the nurse uh, from, um, from uh, Vancouver General Hospital. And she will talk. She will give you kind of a class on clinical trial. So. Please welcome Cindy. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> thank you so much for, uh, so thank you to Myeloma Canada for having us and flying us out to uh, sunny Kelowna. We actually had the sun today by chance in Vancouver, but you know, it's, uh, we know you guys get more sun than us, so it's always lovely to come out here. I love Kelowna. I actually have a best friend who lives in Vernon, so but I won't be able to see her this time, but maybe next time. Um, so thank you for having me. Um, as Francine mentioned, um, so I, I am uh, a nurse at Vancouver General Hospital. I uh, did my first three years on the bone marrow transplant floor. And um, so we used to actually do the myeloma transplants up on the floor, but as some of you maybe know, we now do them as outpatient. Um, so I actually did work in the outpatient unit as well for one year. And the last 10 years though, um, I have been working in research, so I am one of the research nurses, and I've had the opportunity um, to uh, do mostly myeloma trials, um, along with Dr. Kevin Song, so I'm very thankful to him. He kind of got me interested in myeloma, and um, yeah, it kind of just, I kept going with that, and we do a lot of clinical trials with myeloma, so I'm going to talk about some of them. Dr. Song's going to probably talk about more of them. I'll leave a lot of that to him. Um, and yeah, so I'm going to basically talk to you guys about what I've learned over the last 10 years about research and um, just learning some of the clinical trial terminology, the different phases of clinical trials, and we do participate or we do run um, all phases of trials. Um, and yeah, uh, just understanding the three phases of a trial. So this is pertaining to, to you if you were going to be participating in a trial. Um, and we do, I have had patients over the years coming from Kelowna and Kamloops and all over. I kind of have a general philosophy that uh, clinical trials shouldn't just be for, you know, the Vancouver people. It should be for everyone. We're supposed to have a universal healthcare system. Um, so I still ascribe to that philosophy. And uh, yeah, so, you know, we do try to get some travel reimbursement and funding, but it is, it's, it's difficult sometimes to get, but sometimes you guys, you know, you have an aunt or an uncle or a cousin that lives in Vancouver, it makes it a little easier to come and see us for a clinical trial, so. Um, so I'm also going to just talk about what are some of the responsibilities if you are in a clinical trial for you and how and where to search for clinical trials if you want to search for one in the closest center to you. Okay, so first I'll start with some criminal, uh, clinical trial terminology. So um, we actually don't use the word subject. I should have updated this slide here. We don't use the word subject anymore. We're, um, any person who participates in a clinical trial is now called a participant. So that's the, the new thing. Um, and a normal, healthy um, participant uh, is basically, if you were doing a study, this doesn't usually pertain to cancer trials, but if it was, say, a blood pressure or clinical trial or something, they usually will do some testing on a a patient who doesn't have whatever the uh, indication is for. Um, so that would be the normal healthy person. And then um, 
in comparison to the uh, study person. So standard of care is the usual treatment that you would be given if you were not offered a clinical trial. So whatever, whatever um, we have here in British Columbia for whatever phase of the disease you're at, that would be the standard of care. And then the treatment or study group, this is the, um, the, the group that you could get randomized to, um, and they're the people that get the investigational drug, so whatever the study drug is. And um, randomization just means a computer actually randomly assigns a person to either standard therapy or to the study therapy, and it is just a flip of a coin. It's funny, sometimes we've had studies where um, our patients got, so every person that I randomized got the study treatment, and then at another center in Canada, all of their patients got the standard of care treatment. I don't know how that happens sometimes, but it's, it's kind of funny when it does, but it's, it's good for us if we can get this, the, uh, the study drug. Um, a placebo, so um, we sometimes use placebos in, in um, cancer trials. However, if a placebo is used in a cancer trial, um, it's only, it's given in conjunction with standard of care. So you would never be offered a study where the option was to get nothing, because that's not ethical. But what we could do is offer you a study where you could be randomized to either receive standard of care or plus a placebo or standard of care plus a study drug. So just to be really clear on that, I often have patients who ask me about that. Um, and a placebo is just a dummy drug. It's usually uh, like a sugar pill or something, or sugar water, depending if it's an IV drug. Um, we have had to uh, disguise um, uh, drugs sometimes if they're an IV solution, so to make it look like the study drug. Um, and then good, good clinical practice, these are the guidelines that are established by Health Canada. So anybody that's um, wanting to run research has to abide by these. And it's all about safety of the patient. So um, it's to do with con consent, confidentiality, and then the storage of any data that's pertaining to the clinical trial. And these are constantly updated, and um, so we have to we have to actually do GCP training at least every two years. But really, every time we open a new study, we're having to do it again and again. So it's more like we're doing it a few times every year. Um, and then the investigator is the study physician, so whoever um, is running the clinical trial. And there's always one primary investigator, so that's the person who is overseeing the entire trial, the whole conduct of it. But then they can also delegate duties out to another study physician. So a co they're either called a co-investigator or a sub-investigator. So for example, we have had trials in Vancouver where Dr. Song is the primary investigator, but then Dr. Duick would be a co-investigator. And we have run trials like that through the um, BCCA here in the, what is it called now? The Southern Center of something or other. <laughs> Southern Interior, that's what it is, yeah. Um, so yeah, we have run some trials through there. And then the sponsor is the pharmaceutical company um, that is sponsoring the trial. Um, sometimes, if it's an investigator-led um, clinical trial, then sometimes the sponsor is actually the university where that um, investigator, where that, where that physician um, practices in affiliation with. So. Uh, Preclinical trials are trials where new drugs or new molecules are being tested in the lab and then on animals. So for example, they, um, they, they often will use, they'll start with a mice model, so um, they'll inject, let's say, plasma cells into the mouse, so they essentially give the mouse cancer and then they give them whatever molecule it is and see what happens to the cancer inside the mouse. And they'll take pictures of the, the tumor and see if it shrinks and things like that and um, yeah, they observe it. Um, so, what is clinical research? So really, it's an incremental process. It begins as a basic science in a lab. It does involve testing on cells and tissues, and then testing is done on animal models using those human cells. And if it is successful in the mice models, then it can be um, tested in humans in clinical trials. And this is just a schematic, just to kind of show the process. So first you have a discovery of a new molecule in a the lab, then they can enter into the testing on animals, then um, it would usually go to either the, the, the drug company would develop a protocol or the physicians are developing a protocol using that um, molecule. Um, and then that has to get submitted to Health Canada. And then Health Canada has to uh, uh, send out what's called a no objection letter. So they have no objection to that research protocol. Once we get that, then we can start our whole process of getting the uh, clinical trial up and running. So now um, that, at that point, we can use the drug uh, in humans. 
And this process um, can take a while. This can take five, up, at least five years, um, just to get to that point. So then you actually get to the clinical trial phases. And so I'll just go through each phase. So the phase one, this is the earliest uh, phase. So this is when the molecule is really, um, it's the first time being where we actually have a phase one study right now, and we've nicknamed it the first in human trial because it's the first time they're using it in humans. Um, these are very small trials, so usually only 15 to 50 patients. And it's usually we're giving very small doses at a time, and then we're going up very, very slowly. So um, you, you test, let's say, 0.5 milligrams per kilogram in one person, see how they do, see what the side effects are. If it's safe, then you can go on to the next person. And then usually we'll do a couple of patients, maybe three patients at that dose. If it's deemed safe, it goes to a, um, there's usually a, a board of physicians who are um, all participating in the trial. They'll look at the safety, make sure it looks okay. Then they'll give the green light for the next dosing stage. So then we could maybe move up to 0.6 milligrams per kilogram or 0.7, whatever it was predetermined to be. And um, so it is a very s slow process, phase one trials. It is also a really big time commitment for patients because um, when you go on a phase one, we have to make sure um, that your kidneys and liver and heart and everything is okay, as well as, of course, collecting any side effect data. So there's frequent blood testing for this. And often, um, because of cardiac stuff, we're always watching for. So we may have to do ECG um, frequently. So we call those serial ECGs or serial PKs. So for example, we would take a blood test and do an ECG at the beginning, like as soon as you swallow the drug or at the beginning of the infusion of the drug, then we would have to do it again, maybe part way through the infusion or an hour later, then three hours later, then eight hours later, then 24 hours later. So you can imagine if you were trying to travel to um, Vancouver for a clinical trial, if you had to do that weekly or even daily, that would be way too onerous for you probably. Um, but, uh, you know, it's always an option. Um, and so the objectives really of a phase one study is to determine what is the safe dosage range that we can give in humans. So they always kind of have an idea. They kind of over inject the mice and they figure out what the maximum dose is that they can give to a mouse. And then they try to see, they'll always scale it back and start at a smaller dose in humans and then go up. So they kind of have an idea, um, but really we have to still determine what is gonna be the maximum dose that we can go. Um, and then we're also looking for side effects. So just because a mouse gets nausea or their hair falls out doesn't mean that a human's gonna get nausea and their hair falls out or whatever. So. So um, we sort of go into it having a bit of an idea, but not always. Um, so we're collecting that data. And then we're also looking to see how is the drug actually interacting in the human body. So how are you metabolizing it? How, is it, how does it work? And then um, the last thing is looking at efficacy. So how well does the drug actually get rid of the myeloma? So in a phase one trial, subjects may not benefit directly from participating in the research trial. However, we always learn something. So even if it's a loser drug, at least we learned this drug isn't working and then we try to figure out either why, try to figure out do we need to you know, uh, do something different? Do we need to add it to another regimen of medications um, and, uh, and go on to a phase two after that or what's going on? Um, so at least we learn something about it and um, of course the risks are always, this, in phase one especially, the side effects are still unpredictable. So then as long as everything looks safe and it seems to be working even a little bit, even if patients all they got was stable disease, sometimes because in phase one we're usually using the drug way after, um, you know, it could be the fifth or sixth relapse. So at that point, if we can still get a stable disease out of it, that's actually still good. So then if, if you know, side effects look good, it looks like it might work, then we'll move into a phase two. So phase two is to really now tease apart that efficacy and look and see how, how effective is it in this larger population. So we're looking at usually still less than 100 people, but definitely more than 50. And the focus is often on, uh, again, on cancers where there's no effective treatment that exists. So these are going to be end-stage patients. Um, uh, and... Um, and, oh, and all subjects receive the same dose. So by phase two, we have figured out what is that maximum tolerated dose. So MTD is one of the things that you'll read about. Um, and so everybody that gets random or gets put on a phase two study, everybody's getting the same dose. 
The objective here is, um, again, to find out uh, more about the effectiveness of the drug and, of course, to also collect more side effect um, data. So safety information is all about side effects. And again, the benefits, subjects may not direct, directly benefit, but again, we're going to learn more about this drug. How well is it working and should we really go forward? And then the risks. So you can still at this phase, because it's still fairly early, you can get some unpredictable side effects. Um, and also sometimes trials are too short to really determine long-term uh, benefits. Or in myeloma, we're always looking at overall survival. So overall survival can take years and years and years because you guys are living so long now, which is wonderful. Um, so in uh, so once the phase two looks good, efficacy looks good, side effect profile looks to be tolerated fairly well, now we're ready for phase three. So these are usually large multi-center trials, so meaning they're happening all over the globe. So there can be up to 150 sites, um, and there's definitely more than 100 patients. Usually we're looking at 300 plus patients over the whole world. And in these studies, we're looking at um, both something called progression-free survival. So progression-free survival is that time that they measure from the time you start taking the drug until the time that um, the uh, disease starts to progress. And then also quality of life is measured, which is really important too, because you know there's no point in giving people quantity of life unless they also have quality of life. This is sort of my philosophy again. If all you're able to do is sit on the couch, you know, what's the point of that, right? So we want to make sure that you're also still able to get out and do all the things that you want to be doing. Um, and so in a phase three, usually it's a randomized um, study. So that means, again, what I explained before. So you would be randomized to receive either the study drug alone or maybe the study drug with whatever standard of care. And then there's also a group that's just going to receive the standard of care. And so they're trying to really tease out, is the study drug better than standard of care? And this also goes to inform when they get to that P-coder process, when they're actually looking at, um, you know, so they're looking at the data to make sure, yeah, this drug actually looks good and it's working, but also is it um, cost effective and does it make sense, you know, from a, a health um health economics perspective as well. Um, because if the drug is super expensive uh, in comparison to standard of care, and if it's working about the same, then what's the point of this more expensive drug? So in Canada, because we're a public system, a publicly funded system, we always have to be mindful of that. Um, again, so the objectives in phase three is determine whether a new therapy or drug is more effective and or has fewer side effects than the standard of care. And again, the benefits, subjects may not benefit directly from participating in this um, phase. Um, but of course, again, we're always hoping that we're going to learn something. And then the risks. So sometimes it turns out that this new treatment is not better than or even as good as the standard of care. Sometimes the side effects are actually worse than those associated with standard of care. So I have been involved in some trials where um, the when we added in the study drug to the standard of care, um, the side effects were actually uh, it, it basically, whatever side effects you were going to get, it made them much worse. And really, when they looked at the difference in efficacy, it only amounted to about three months difference. So that was deemed to be sort of not worth it to go forward and get funding for, the, for that. Um, so that's what we're looking for here. And then, of course, in f even in phase three, we still can see unexpected side effects occurring. Um, this is why it's really important to do long-term follow-up, which is what we always do with all of our studies. So basically, I tell my patients, once you sign up with us, you'll never be rid of me. <laughs> I will forever be calling at least every three to six months to see how you're doing. So <laughs> it's both a, a good thing and a bad thing, right? <laughs> It's a good thing, yes. Uh, all my patients have told me that. So. <laughs> um, so how are subjects protected during a clinical trial? So there's really, there's four different ways. So the ethics board, so every study has to get approval by an ethics board. So they have to look at the protocol. They, um, you know, they, they'll tweak it. They'll, they'll look at it and tell us if there's something that they don't like about it. Um, and they're always looking at, at it from the perspective of, of you, the patient, as, as the person, and what are the risks to you. Um, and often on ethics boards, they actually do sometimes have patients on the board so that that can, you know, you can also get your opinion in there. And if you're interested in serving on any ethics boards, you should definitely look into that. You can Google it. 
Um, and uh, then Health Canada, of course, with the GCP guidelines, is all about um, safety of the patient. So that and uh, you know mandating how we consent patients. So you can't you know you have to tell a patient that they're getting this or that, and um, you can't just you know give somebody a, a study drug without telling them about it and all of that kind of stuff, which actually used to happen you know over 50 years ago. Um, so the tri-council policy statement is also just part of that whole Health Canada stuff, GCP guidelines, um, also pertaining to safety and making sure that we're doing everything according to regulatory authorities. And then, of course, us, your study team, the physicians, the nurses, pharmacists, anyone who's participating in the clinical trial, we have to be all trained on all of these things, um, GCP and everything. And so we're also having to make sure that everything looks good. And we're the ones who, so the sponsor will give us a consent form for you, but we tweak it according to how we see fit and also according to our ethics board rules and things like that. So there's really quite a few layers to try to make safe or to, to try to make sure it's as safe as possible for patients. Confidentiality, so there's a number of um, ways that your confidentiality is protected. PEPIDA is one of them. This is a personal information protection and electronic documents act. Um, we also of course have uber firewalls and all of our computer systems and everything in the hospital. We never give out any of your personal information to a study sponsor, so your address, phone number, SIN number. The only things that we're really allowed to tell a sponsor is your ethnic background. And the reason we ask for that actually is because there's some ethnicities that the cancer may behave differently in or the drug may behave differently in. Um, so, for example, um, African Americans have uh, there's a higher popu or there's a higher um, percentage of them that get myeloma. We don't know why. Um, there's theories about that, but um, uh, and we don't know if maybe certain medications would work differently in another ethnic background's body, um, say in the Asian population. Um, and then also uh, the sponsor needs to know any side effects that you have when you're on the medication. Um, they need to know all other medications that you're taking, any of your baseline history, because again, what we're trying to tease out is if you have you know, high blood pressure and history of cardiac issues and you had a cardiac issue while you're taking a study medication, we need to tease out, is this a pre-existing thing? Is this something that the study drug is causing? Did we make it worse? Um, or you know, did you just happen to come off your medication, your heart medication, or something like this? So we need to know lots of the nitty gritty details about that. And of course, while you're on the trial too, if you're actually admitted to hospital, we also have to um, notify the sponsor about that because if you were admitted to hospital because of the study drug, this is really, really, really important information for them to have. And actually, when if a patient who's on a clinical trial gets admitted to a hospital, that information is also sent out to every participating site. That way, every doctor who's participating, um, so all the primary investigators, they all know, okay, there's been, you know, X number of, you know, hospitalizations due to whatever, pneumonia or something like this. And then they can kind of also keep it in the back of their minds to watch out for that and things like that. So the phases during a clinical trial. So, so if you're put on a clinical trial, this is what you could expect. So during the screening phase, um, first thing you have to do is sign a consent form. So usually um, the physician will introduce the study to the patient and then they'll introduce the patient to me and then we give you the consent form. I'll go through it really briefly, but then I give it to you. You take it home. You can look at it with your family. You can look at it with your general practitioner, whoever you want, show it to whoever you want and then call me or you can call your physician with any questions or email. And once you decide that you're definitely on board, you wanna do this, then you come and meet up with me and we sign the consent form. Then we can start the screening procedures. Um, there has been cases where, um, so especially for patients who live out of town, if you tell me over the phone, yeah, I really wanna go on this study, but you haven't signed the consent form yet, I'll take that as a verbal, and then I can start at least booking all of your tests so that I can have all of your tests booked and you can come sign the consent form with me the first, that very first day, prior to any of those tests being done. And screening procedures usually involve blood work. Uh, usually we're doing a full skeletal survey at this point, so that's the head to toe x-ray. Um, any CT scans if you have a plasma cytoma as well. I make sure I know all of your medical history and you'll also be seen by your physician for a physical assessment. 
and we go over the inclusion and exclusion criteria. Um, so again, this the inclusion and exclusion criteria is there to, to dictate to us who the patient population is for that study. And then we're looking at the screening procedures and the results of them, and we're looking at the inclusion criteria to make sure that you still are eligible for the trial. Once you've passed all of that, then we can proceed to the treatment phase. So treatment phase starts on cycle one, day one. And randomization may occur if it's that type of a study, but uh, perhaps it's just everyone's getting the same thing, so it's just an enrollment. That's it. There is no randomization. We may need to repeat some blood work and some other tests. We're going to go through complete head-to-toe, uh, how to take the drug, what stipulations, if it's an oral medication, if you um, happen to throw it up, what to do, if you have uh, you know, any issues, side effects, who to call, when to call. All of those phone numbers are given to you. You'll be reminded of the common side effects to watch out for to, and to report. And um, basically, yeah, the gist of that is even if you, if you don't think it's related to the study drug, tell me anyway. So if you trip and fall and stub your toe, I still want to know about it because maybe you had some kind of a fainting episode which could have been related to the drug, but you didn't attribute it to that because maybe you hadn't eaten that morning and you were feeling a bit weak or whatever. Uh, but we still need to record everything. And then it's actually up to the physician to decide, does he think that that was related or not to the study drug? And then, uh, yeah, any other medications? So if while on the trial, um, your family physician prescribes you, maybe they've upped one of your medications that you're already on, or they give you a new medication if you had a cold or whatever, they were giving you something, or the flu shot, I need to just record it. Um, and uh, any surgeries, hospital admissions, and any blood transfusions, platelet transfusions, nupogen injections need to know all of that. Keeping a diary is helpful. Often nowadays I find that the sponsors are actually giving us, they're mandating we have to give you a diary. And it's actually good because it helps you to keep track of all of this stuff, especially because most of our trials nowadays are triple combo therapy. So we're giving you three different drugs to take. <laughs> that just, this is the way that the myeloma is now being treated nowadays is usually we're trying to target more than one thing of the disease. So we're giving you two or three medications at a time to take. So it can be difficult to keep track of all that. So a calendar is very helpful. And then if you're also having any side effects, again, teasing out, if you're on a triple combo therapy, teasing out some of these side effects and what's contributing to what, let's say dexamethasone. So sometimes we don't know is, is let's say you're having diarrhea. We, if, you, if you actually write down on the calendar the days you're having the diarrhea, then we can, it can help inform us anyway. Is this actually related to the Revlimid or is it related to the dexamethasone or is it related to the bortezomib or whatever you're on? Because all of those drugs can cause diarrhea, right? So... Um, this way, it just it, sometimes it helps. Sometimes it's still not helpful because if the diarrhea is sporadic, then you know we're still scratching our heads, and then we just have to go one by one and try dose, redu dose, dose reducing one or the other. Um, yeah, and then so in the treatment phase, it'll continue for as long as you're able to tolerate it, or as long as it's still working. So as long as it's still managing your disease, you can continue according to the study protocol. Sometimes the study protocol mandates that we're only going to give 12 cycles or whatever. And then in the follow-up phase, so um, there's always an end of treatment visit. Sometimes if um, patients live far away and they're too sick to make it for this end of treatment visit, we'll just try to get whatever we can get. So if all we can get is some blood work just to make sure liver, kidneys, th those things are okay, then that's what we do. But we always try to get you to come back to the site to do whatever the end of treatment visit actually requires. So it's usually blood work, x-rays, maybe a bone marrow biopsy, just depends. Um, and these are done to ensure that you're still safe, even if you're coming off of the trial. And then follow up, I mentioned, once you sign up for a clinical trial, you're never rid of me pretty much <laughs> because the long-term follow-up now, we're trying to follow you for as long as possible. So that can go on for many, many years. So sometimes blood work is needed, but usually it's just a phone call just to see how you're doing, see what new medications you're on, whatever, it, you know, if, if your disease pro, um, relapsed, what is the new treatment you're on? And nowadays, too, we're always mindful of any second cancers. Um, so we're usually asking about any of those as well if you've been diagnosed with any second um, cancers. So if you wanted to find some more information on clinical trials, you can, of course, go to myelomacanada.ca. I'm going to walk through these just a little bit more um, in my coming slides. Cancerview.ca, uh, the bccancer.bc.ca website also lists um, some of the ones that are done at BCCA. 
Um, and of course, our program, the Leukemia BMT program, although ours is not always up to date, it's usually a couple of months behind. Uh, the one that I really like, though, is the clinicaltrials.gov. This one actually lists all clinical trials that are being, you can actually do a nice search, and I'm going to show you just really briefly how to do that. So this is the Myeloma Canada website, and this is where you can actually find, so if you go on to uh, research and clinical trials is right here, and then you could just click on clinical trials in Canada, and then it'll bring up this page. And here you can click on clinical trials if you're a newly diagnosed patient or if you're a relapsed patient. Um, I think the Myeloma Canada website is going to be uh, updated shortly. Um, yeah, so the, the location of these pages may change, um, but it'll still uh, be there uh, somewhere. And then this is the Cancer View Canada website. I'm not super familiar with this one, but I think it, it's over here that you can look for an organization close to you that's participating in a clinical trial. And um, this is, oh yeah, also part of Cancer View. So this is what comes up. You'll see, you know, there's this one for uh, Deltaparin for uh, treatment of blood clots. There's this one for combination bortezomib, regimens in newly diagnosed patients. Um, and this, and it'll also show the status if it's still open and recruiting patients or not. And then clinicaltrials.gov, this one, you just go over here to search for clinical trials. And then in here, in this space, you can just put myeloma and Canada. That'll bring up only the Canadian sites. Oh, and then, and then it'll pop up um, basically um, There'll be a, a list of protocols. You can click on one for if it's relapsed or newly diagnosed patients. And um, it'll also give you some of the inclusion exclusion criteria. It'll tell you who's participating, if it's still recruiting. Uh, recruiting. Yeah, so it'll give you some information. And it'll also usually give you contact information, who to contact. And then this is our website. Um, so ours are over here, if you click on the research link for healthcare professionals. And then, oh no, sorry, actually, it's under general information for research. So that's, um, I'll just go back over here, this side. And so you click here, and then uh, this just gives you some information about how to um, be on a, or entering a clinical trial. Is it right for you? Frequently asked questions. There's also a link here for our hematology cell bank. Um, this is where we are freezing samples basically for researchers to be doing um, that uh, molecular sort of research uh, in the lab, biology stuff. And um, what else comes up? So if you were to click on the research um, icon over here, this is going to bring up clinical trials and publications. And again, I don't know if this is um, super up to date, but this is where you can find this information. Yeah. So that's about it for that. Um, the only other thing I would like to add, I guess, is just for the Myeloma Canada Research Network, um, that will probably, uh, this will be on the Myeloma Canada website. Um, and uh, we are doing several trials as well through the Myeloma Canada Research Network. I think uh, Dr. Song is gonna talk more in depth about that, um, but also an exciting initiative. And basically the, you know, the, the whole vision of that was to try to bring as many Canadian centers doing the same trial. Because what's happening right now is, you know, the sponsor will come to let's say Vancouver or Toronto and offer them the protocol but what about everybody in between you know Saskatchewan Ontario or um, uh, Manitoba New Brunswick the Maritimes so that's the real beauty about MCRN is there's 16 Canadian centers now as opposed to just two that are doing all the same study now it's not going to be as many studies but still at least it's something so that's really amazing so just in summary, um, the three phases of clinical trials I talked about, so phase one, which is a small number of patients, and this is really to determine that maximum tolerated dose and what are the side effects. And then phase two uh, involves more patients and also still determining side effects, but also really looking at the efficacy of the drug, how well it's working. And then phase three, we're going forward with more than 100 patients. This is usually a global trial, and we're further determining the side effect profile and comparing the effectiveness to standard of care. So we're always comparing to standard standard of care at this point. And once it gets through phase three, that's when it's going to get into um, whether it goes for Health Canada approval, whether it makes it to that P coder process, and then finally we can prescribe it to you and give it to you as standard of care. And that whole process takes about 10 years actually. 
And then the three phases within a clinical trial, screening, so you have to sign consent, we determine if you're eligible or not, lots of tests are performed, and then the treatment, um, there's a, sometimes a randomization, sometimes not, and then you just take the drug according to the protocol which we would be teaching you, and then you're followed very closely by the study team. And then fo follow-up usually um, involves an end-of-study visit and then usually a phone call or a visit if you're close to the center or an email um, every three to six months. And we're usually following up for survival data, but also to see how you're doing and uh, what new medications you've been on. So your responsibility, so when you get that informed consent, read it very carefully. Um, and ask as many questions as you need. So even, and also just know, even if you do sign up for a clinical trial, the consenting process is a process. So just because you signed it today, if you still have questions tomorrow, next week, next month, even if you've started taking the drug and you still have questions, you, it's, it's a process and you can always withdraw consent at any time. So if you got on the trial and you really felt like you didn't wanna be there anymore, you can always withdraw at any time. And side effects, really important to report everything, even if you think it's not related to the study drug. And take note of any start and stop dates of any drugs you're taking. And same thing for uh, any med other medications that you're taking. CONMED stands for concomitant medications. So any drugs, vitamins, herbs, even procedures, blood transfusions that you get while on a clinical trial, we need to know about it. And then keep a diary. Um, it's very helpful so you can write down everything. Any side effects that are happening, we'll be writing down on there when to take what drug on what day. And that's all I have. So I just, uh, yeah, if you visit Myeloma Canada's website, you can get a bunch of the links that I discussed today. And these are just some of my references. And that's it, thank you. Any questions? <laughs> Yes. Yes, Mayo Clinic, uh, MD Anderson, Fred Hutchinson, um, Seattle. Um, They're advanced in their stage. You would promote your clinical trial up to that stage, or would you still go through the normal test procedure? Uh, so, so the it's the protocol that dictates what we have to do, and everybody has to do the same thing according to the protocol, whether you're their Mayo Clinic or whether it's us. So so it's the protocol that dictates the procedures and things that we have to do. Okay. Does so that make sense? If, it's, uh, if they have an advanced stage and they are further with their trials, then you would boost your trial up to that or would you still continue through the same procedures of the trial? Um, do you mean the drug or the which, which part of the trial are, do you mean? Yeah, with the participants and as to the development, as to the progress and how it's developing and whether it's uh, successful or unsuccessful or whatever the case may be? Yeah, so all of the physicians talk. So they're all, everybody's at the same stage for the trial, but there can be, so maybe we're participating in the phase three trial, but Mayo Clinic is doing both phase one, two, and three. Um, so, but everybody is, you know, they're reporting on data, um, yeah, you, you can't go from one study, though, to another. Those, it's, you, you stay on the study that you've been recruited for. Yeah. Yeah, I guess, well, in my wife's case, right, sit beside me here, she was on a brain tumor, so mm -hmm. she was with the Mayo Clinic plus London, Ontario, and Calgary Foothills. Okay. So uh, everything was selective all the way through. Was in it for fact, th in three fact, different the studies? Clinic, they or? stopped, uh, they were going to go ahead with the with the drug vincristine and so on. Yep. And then they stopped that and they said, okay, now we have to harvest your stem cells first okay, yep. before they've been injected with any drug. Yep. So they went, in fact, they called us back to the hospital so we had to go back in and start all over again. Oh. And then they went through the, they took the Mayo, Mayo Clinic's protocol yep. and went that way. And then they harvest the stem cells first and then they, give, they froze those for six months and proceed with the drug and then yep. went from there. So. Mm. It was quite uh, unique how that happened. Yeah, so sometimes um, sometimes we can do things, it's tougher for us in Canada to do things that are outside of whatever has been funded or indicated. So so Health Canada will you know, indicate what we can use the drug for and things like that. So if we can only use it in the relapse setting and that's all we have funding for, then we could only use it like that. Uh, Mayo Clinic has a bit more, um, they can kind of do what they want, you know, so uh, same with some of these other sites in the States. So yeah, sometimes patients will opt to go down to them and get that 
whatever that therapy is um, until such time that it's available in Canada and then they can be switched over. So we've had patients who went down to the States for a clinical trial and then, um, you know, then they come back to us and sometimes we're helping them with their follow-up and blood work and things like that. So yeah, we do um, kind of try to work together a bit. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? We have a question online. Oh, sure. I'll just paraphrase this question sure. because it's a long question, which comes from Ian McDonald. And the question is essentially that going to Vancouver for a clinical trial is not necessarily that easy. Mm -hmm. um, it's a lot of work for people to travel. They might be sick or whatnot. Yeah. But they may live closer to another hospital that can do a lot of the testing or whatnot. Um, in the current environment with the technologies available and, and internet or that, what is being done to facilitate someone who lives far away mm -hmm. to come to a center like Vancouver for treatment to minimize their travels, et cetera? Yeah, so I get asked this all the time and that really, you know, geographically we're such a huge province and I mean in Canada this is generally a problem. So, um, you know, there are certain visits that we just can't get away from. They have to come to the centre. Um, so often there's, you know, a specific, it's not just about getting blood work, it's a specific kit um, with specific tubes and things and recs and then it has to be shipped. So it depends. I sometimes can get, um, so for example right now I'm looking into getting Life Labs. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm doing a contract with them so that they can do some of the blood work so that patients don't have to come and see me as frequently but they still do have to come for certain visits. So for example, if they have to see the study physician every six months, we can't really get around that. Um, and it depends what is involved in the actual visit because we do have telehealth as well. But um, even with that, so it depends what we need to, if we need to do vital signs, for example, well then you have to come to the center to have that done. Um, if it is just a phone call that can be done, we can sometimes facilitate that over, over the phone and we have done that for another trial. Um, so yeah, it's not really, an, uh, it's, it's a difficult, it's a complex thing. So um, the short answer is sometimes we can and sometimes we can't facilitate it. Sometimes you just have to come to the hospital for the testing. There's no ways around it. More questions? Thank you, So um, any time, um, so I have actually done a study through BCCA's um, uh, hospital here, um, but they have to be set up under, they have to be under the ethics board approval certificate. So there's all these guidelines around that and paperwork, basically bureaucracy stuff, right? So as long as if they were listed as a site that's participating, then we could do some procedures through them, yes. Okay. Um, so it just depends how the study is set up. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, this. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, you know, that's. I'm not sure who all the email went out to. Um, this is Francine's er, uh, area, but uh, sure. Ron? Uh, because of uh, confidentiality, we can't get a hold of, of the patients out there. So, it's very, very difficult for us to. Uh, find the patients for this kind of a session. And uh, I visited uh, the oncology department in Salmon Arm and Vernon and uh, uh, Marlene Godfrey was a big push in Vernon. But in Kelowna, I ran into great difficulties. The oncology department there is, is absolutely huge. And like Penticton was very easy to get into and see the people and put up posters. But uh, they got some really strong gatekeepers in Kelowna. It was very difficult to get through. However, Kelowna is my treatment center and the staff there and the volunteers and the nurses are par excellent. You know, they're just super wonderful. 
but we weren't able to put up posters and I had little triangle things that we put up in different areas just with uh, the inf a little bit of the information and my phone number. So what I'll do later is give you a sheet if you, if you want to uh, help us start an information center here in the Kelowna area. It actually covers all of Revel, uh, from Revelstoke, Salmon Arm, uh, we even have a person from Nelson here today, and goes right down to a Soyuz. So it's a pretty, pretty big area. So information getting out was difficult, but we did the best, and, and the Myeloma Society helped us a bit in Kelowna. If I just may add, if you have internet, you can go online on myelomacanada.ca and just register. We send uh, information about the info session every time we, there's one coming. Okay? So, thank you. Is that it? Thank you, okay. Cindy. I'm around if you have more questions. <laughs> So thank you very much, Cindy, for this uh, great informative session on uh, Myeloma uh, 101. So we'll now switch to uh, our next presenter, or our next speaker. Sorry, I'm, I'm kind of having trouble switching the, the um <laughs> sorry about that. Um, Okay, I'll let the tech guy do that and I will introduce. <laughs> so so uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Kevin Song. We've talked about him. He's a uh, specialist, a myeloma specialist working at the Vancouver General Hospital and he will talk uh, more about uh, the uh, drug and the uh, clinical trial that will, uh, that will open shortly. In, uh, in the Vancouver area and in for the BC patient uh, more generally. So welcome, Dr. Song. <laughs> Thank you for having me here. Um, I come to Kelowna three or four times a year to see patients at the Kelowna Outreach Clinic at the uh, BCCA Southern Interior, and I think there are a couple of faces here that are familiar to me. But uh, um, this is the first time I've actually given an info session to patients, and I think it's really great because obviously, you know, our program, which is leukemia bone marrow transplant program, we cover the province of British Columbia in the best way that we can. And I must admit, uh, doing multiple myeloma has been interesting because on the one hand, we have a responsibility to the province because we do transplants for all patients with uh, multiple myeloma in British Columbia. Yet at the same time, the responsibility for taking care of multiple myeloma is actually quite local in its own way because you're diagnosed locally. Um, you might get the transplant in Vancouver, but you go back home to your local physicians, be they in Nanaimo, Prince George, or whatnot. So there is kind of this like um, shared care model that we have in multiple myeloma, and I think it's very, very interesting. So I, when I see people in the clinic, I see them at a very tight time period of their transplant, and in that period, we're really focused on high-dose chemotherapy. But this talk is really more beyond that in terms of, you know, what is happening afterwards. And I think that that's what I don't really have a chance to talk to people about. So I think it's a, it's a great uh, privilege for me to have a chance to talk to you about that. And so hopefully I can give you a little bit of insights into where the future is headed. So I really come to you talking to you about multiple myeloma, not as the myeloma doctor in British Columbia, but as one of the myeloma doctors in British Columbia. And what I mean by that is that my group, everybody in my group, takes care of multiple myeloma patients. And we have myeloma doctors across the province, including Southern Interior, and that includes patients, uh, physicians that you guys all are familiar with, Dr. Duick, Dr. Wadwa, uh, Dr. Topic, Dr. Main, and these are all people who actually are very good at what they do. I guess the difference is that I, go around the province talking to people, whereas these people actually sit down and take care of the patients. So in that, in that sense, you know, I think the one thing that sometimes people think is that I'm the only per physician who treats multiple myeloma in the province, but that's not the case. You guys have excellent doctors here, and it's just, I guess, my privilege to be able to try to talk about uh, everything that goes on here. So I've done a couple of talks regarding clinical trials in multiple myeloma in British Columbia, and I apologize as I was updating the slide, I uh, forgot to change uh, um, uh, Vancouver to Kelowna, because obviously we're in Kelowna, not in Vancouver, but uh, uh, so if you see some mistakes like that, I apologize, uh, you know, I didn't have a chance to look at everything. 
So the first thing I just wanted to point out is that uh, I have some disclosures. Um, and that's, uh, um, you know, we as physicians obviously are trying our best for our patients, but we do have some links with industry. And as opposed to just giving you three seconds on this slide, I just wanted you to see this because uh, on the one hand, yes, I do have these links with the industry, and so you must keep that in mind because I, you know, I'm going to do my best to give you an unbiased presentation. Yet at the same time, the reason why I do have these links to industry is because multiple myeloma is exploding in terms of the developments that's happening. And with that, pharmaceutical industries are investing heavily into this. And if you want to be a part of the game, you actually have to link up with them. You actually, to be a you know, to really, you have to be able to speak to the people who are doing the drug development to be able to try to bring it to 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 uh, um, you know people here. So, a brief outline of what uh, I'm going to talk about. Um, uh, unfortunately, today we're not going to do anything like a myeloma 101 talk, uh, which typically happens in uh, patient forum, and that's because. Everyone here will have various levels of education in multiple myeloma. Now, I won't be able to spend much time on that, so I'll just go over some quick uh, principles regarding that in the hopes that we can put you in the mood for understanding where these trials fit in. Um, I'll just briefly mention the phases of the trials that Cindy has already done, and then I'll talk about some of the trials that we're participating in. Now, some of you will be much more educated than others because some of you will have been dealing with your condition for a much longer period of time. Also, we're all very different. Some of you will be on the internet yesterday, today, tomorrow to try to understand what's going on, whereas other people here will go home, do your daily activities, and wait until you see your doctors to talk about what else is going on. So uh, with that in mind, I apologize because obviously people will get different things out of this talk when I talk about the different molecules that are around. Some people will understand it very well. Other people, it'll just be knowing that some funny name stuff is coming out in the future. But really, it's just to show you that a lot of things are happening. And then finally, I'll give you some concluding remarks about uh, where we're headed. So this is, this is a graph about the natural history of multiple myeloma. And the reason why I'd like to show you this is because everybody is in a different stage of the journey, typically. Some people are just diagnosed. Some people are coming to the latter stages of multiple myeloma. And what I mean by that is that, unfortunately, multiple myeloma is still not curable. Yet, at the same time, there's a lot of things that can happen in between. So you have your patients who are diagnosed with active myeloma right at the beginning where the, where the, where the line just shoots up. And when you're diagnosed at that time, you get some type of treatment. And so those who are transplant eligible get transplanted. And then at that point, your myeloma goes into some form of remission. And then, unfortunately, a number of people will relapse. They'll get other treatments. They'll go into a remission again. And that'll happen repetitively for some people many times, or for some people less amount of times, until eventually nothing starts working. And the reason why I want to point that out is because the journey is, in general, quite long. Yet at the same time, there are multiple points in that journey. And if there are multiple points in that journey, there are multiple points where you get treatment. And if there are multiple points where you get treatments, there are multiple points where you can potentially go on a clinical trial. And so that's one of the reasons why multiple myeloma is very exciting, because a person could be on many trials over the course of their disease course. And with this in mind, what are the treatments that we have available? Well, back in the 60s, 50s and 60s, the major development was oral melphalan and prednisone. Now, most of you will not know this combination if you were diagnosed in the past five to 10 years. But that combination was developed really with prop, the godfather of myeloma in Canada, a person named Daniel Bergsegel, who, who was born in the prairies and eventually moved to the Princess Margaret Hospital, where he developed this combination. And that combination was the standard treatment for about 30 years. And that's not because people sat on their, uh, on their hands. They did a lot of research, but none of that research showed that anything was better than this very simple combination of oral mofilin and prednisone. And the big development that happened in the, in the eight, late 80s and 90s was stem cell transplant, where you actually increased the dose of melphalan that you got, and with that, people got better remissions, and they got stem cell rescues. And so that was a big thing back in the 90s. That was all the research. How do you give stem cell transplant to older people, blah, blah, blah? Do you give one, two, or three, or whatnot? So it was a big advance, but really, in terms of drug therapy-wise, it wasn't really a big difference. You had p pomidronate that came out around that time as well too, but really, there wasn't really much that happened. 
But around 1999, there was a publication in the New England Journal of Medicine where they found that a drug, thalidomide, began to work for multiple myeloma. And based upon that, um, a company, a startup called Celgene, began to modify that molecule and found many derivatives. And with that, you know, the field of multiple myeloma got launched because incredibly, you know, these molecules were all slightly different. They all worked slightly differently. And, and, and wow, people were living so much longer. And around that time, this drug called bortezomib, most people know it as Velcade, was also developed. So these two drugs, which we currently take for granted, became pillars of multiple myeloma therapy over the past 10 years. And since that time, there has been a whole bunch of newer drugs that have been developed that are currently being studied, et cetera. And it's been a very exciting time since about uh, the past 15 years, and I've been fortunate because really that's been my career. Has that made a difference? And I think that, you know, it was really exciting to see some of this literature coming out back in the late 2000s. So around 2008, this was published by the Mayo Clinic, where they have a lot of data on their patients. And what they looked at were patients who had autologous stem cell transplant, which was standard treatment for those who are eligible, and what happened to them when they relapsed. Now, this is a survival curves, and I apologize because I'm certain that not everybody understands how survival curves are. But essentially, if you look at the curves, you'll see that there are five curves that are there. And the ones where the curves drops to the bottom really quickly means that people aren't doing very well. And the ones where it stays much more flatter before it gradually drops means that they're doing better. And so if you look at the green line, those are people who relapsed before 1998, which is before thalidomide. If you look at the green line, that falls down quite quickly. So if you had a transplant and you relapsed before 1998, really 50% of patients were dead within about a year. Now, if you look farther on down, you see the yellow line and the uh, um, uh, light uh, blue or turquoise line, and you see that that is much more separated out, such that if, you show, if it shows that if you relapsed in 2002, 2003, or 2004, 2005, you did much better than those who relapsed back in the late 90s. And so the benefit was probably a number of years. And so this is data from the Mayo Clinic, the United States. You know. We'd all love to go there, but most of us can't afford to go there. We have to be stuck with what our Canadian healthcare system for all that it's worth. So is our Canadian healthcare system doing us any good? Well, lo and behold, it is. It's probably just as good as the Mayo Clinic. And this is data published uh, that we published in uh, a journal called Leukemia and Lymphoma back in 2011. And uh, Dr. Christopher Venner, who is currently uh, um, um, a colleague of mine in Edmonton was doing his fellowship in Vancouver, and we looked at patients who were relapsing from an autologous stem cell transplant around 2004. And those who relapsed before it, they got about 16 months more of survival when they relapsed. And after that, they seemed to get more like three and a half to four years. And so these new drugs are definitely providing improved survival for people who have the chance to be exposed to this drug. So we in Canada are benefiting just as much as anybody else in the world uh, with these new drugs that are around. So really, this is a demonstration how, of how drug development has changed so much over the past 15 years. But of course, we're not here to talk about the past 15 years. We need to talk about where we're headed in the future. And so this is just a slide which shows you in the middle, it's a cell. It's what we call plasma cell. And a plasma cell is the cancer cell that's uh, uh, in the body of patients with multiple myeloma. And all those funny little bubbles are what we call those, uh, you know, a signal link pathway. So these things that the biologists look at. And then all of the words all around it are the types of molecules that are being tested. And there's tons of them. And I only put boxes around them just to show you different classes of them. So there's a lot of drug development that's going on. And it's almost impossible to understand how they're placing what and where and how they're different from each other. But Actually, that's why it's so exciting, because there's so much that's going on, uh, on, on with myeloma compared to other disease sites where they don't have as much activity that's ha happening there. So taking a step back once again, what do we have available today? We have four classes of drugs that are available. One is the alkylators, which is cyclophosphamide and melphalan, and a lot of you would know cyclophosphamide because um, those of you who are diagnosed with myeloma probably got cyclophosphamide with your Velcade and the dexamethasone combination. And the second drug is obviously corticosteroids, which is the dexamethasone. And over the past 15 years, we've got two new classes of drugs. One is the immunomodulatory drugs, which is, for most people, if you're aware of this, it's the lenalidomide or revlimid, and more recently, pomalidomide or pomalist. And then the fourth class of drug is the protozoan inhibitors, which is bortezomib. And so with these four classes, you know, we, we're, we certainly have a lot more than we did 15 years ago. But the future 
remains extremely exciting because there are other classes of drugs that are currently being studied in multiple myeloma. They are antibodies, drugs such as daratumumab, alotuzumab, other drugs called deacetylase inhibitors such as panobinostat, forinostat, and then of course, um, you know, they have actually have second and, and, and third generation proteasome inhibitors like carfilzomib that a lot of you would have heard of, and a new drug called ixazomib, which has recently been approved by the Americans. The FDA just came out in the past week. And then many other classes of drugs that are still being looked at, such as a drug called Phacelnexor, Phalanacib, AKT inhibitors, et cetera. So it gets very confusing to tell you the honest truth. And the hardest thing for me will be to have you walk out of this room knowing what I talked about versus walking out feeling confused. But if you are confused, I'll be glad because you'll walk away confused that there's so much out there that you just don't understand it, okay? So Cindy went over the tri phases of the trials. Once again, there's phase one, there's phase two, and phase three, and there's actually a phase four. So phase one is when you're trying it to find out whether someone can get it without being harmed by it, and, and also you hope that there's a slight positive effect, but you're really making certain that they're not harmed by it and how, what is the maximum dose they can tolerate. Phase two is when you think that you've gotten a dose where they're not harmed by it, but you might have a good chance of responding to it and they're taking a larger number of patients exposing everybody to the drug at this set dose. And then phase three is where you're comparing it to make certain it's better than the standard. Phase four is when the drug is approved and they're looking at it afterwards to see, have we missed anything? For instance, we did the trial on a thousand patients and we found out that you know heart attacks was common and that's what we're saying. But now we're doing it, we're seeing afterwards that in 10, 20,000 people, wow, you know, kidney problems are also common in this. So it's like a post-marketing you know, uh, phases of uh, understanding the drug. So those are uh, the phases, as, as Cindy had mentioned, that we have. The other thing is that we have many drugs that are being tested, and drugs can be tested singly, meaning just by themselves, or they try to test it in combinations. And thirdly, they have stages of myeloma that they're testing at. First, you can have people who are newly diagnosed, you can have people who have relapsed once or twice, or you can have people who have multi relapsed many times over. So when you look at that, the phases of the trials, the drugs that are being tested in single and combination, and the stages of myeloma that are being tested, you can think of a huge amount of combinations of how you can do studies. For instance, let's say, let's talk about a drug that you know, most of you know quite well, which is bortezomib or Velcade. You can test that in phase one, two, three, and four. You can also test that drug as a single agent or in combination with Revlimid, for instance, or you can also test it in newly diagnosed after one relapse, after three relapse. So you can have one drug that's being tested in so many different scenarios. So there are tons of scenarios in which testing can be done. But the counterpart to that is, is that you could have a drug like bortezomib or Velcade that's being tested in myeloma, but it's not being tested for someone who is in your situation. So let's say you're someone who's newly diagnosed and you want to be, you want this new drug that you heard about on the internet. And lo and behold, Vancouver Kelowna is doing that. And you call them up and you find out, and we tell you, oh, unfortunately, you're not the group that we're testing it because we're testing it in people who are not transplant eligible, who have relapsed five times or something like that. So this is where on the one end, you can have so many trials of multiple myeloma, but you have to fit a certain category for it. And this is where it can be confusing. The other thing that I just want to point out is that Clinical trials are important. It's very helpful for us to do it, but ultimately we want to get to the point where the drug is in use. And what I mean by that is that you can get the drug in Prince George, in Salmon Arm, and in, uh, in, in Nelson, and you don't have to travel to Vancouver for a clinical trial, because ultimately that's what we want. That's what we're trying to accomplish. But unfortunately, for drugs to get there, you have to go through all these phases. And so why am I mentioning that? It's because you'll hear about a drug that sounds very exciting, but it might take three, four, five years before it gets to the in-use stage. And so in that sense, it can be frustrating, but that's part of the issue of drug development. So just to give you a little bit of a background history on ter in terms of the clinical trials of myeloma in British Columbia, back around 2005 at Vancouver General, we started up this hematology research and clinical trials unit. And this, the purpose of this was to evaluate treatments for blood diseases, to find more effective drugs that are less toxic. And importantly, to try to provide BC residents with access to new drugs as soon as possible. Uh, and to improve the quality of life of these patients. 
Now, the thing about clinical trials is that we get minimal support from the government. They might give us a little bit of space to work, but they don't give us money for salaries of the nurses, of the research people. They don't give us support for the computers. So interestingly enough, when this unit was formed, the uh, seed money was actually came from myeloma patients who donated money to us, some very wealthy people. And so that's what allowed us to get going. But we continue to try to keep ourselves funded and supported, particularly by doing trials in a way that we can make money off the trials to keep ourselves going. It's not a for-profit group, but at the same time, we don't have anybody to help us out if we're in the red. So this is some of the limitations that we have. But importantly, we've been able to do some very important trials in multiple myeloma through this group, which was established in 2005. To give you an example, bortezomib or Velcade, which, you, which everyone currently knows as a standard treatment we take for granted, was not available 15 years ago. And so when the drug was getting approved in the US and Canada, what happened was that uh, before it became available, the company approached uh, the BCCA and Vancouver General about doing what we call an expanded access protocol. It's kind of a trial. We have to have research nurses or whatnot. So we decided to do that so that we could try to get the drugs to people before the cancer agency was funding the drug. And so that was actually our first m m modern myeloma trial. And with that, the benefit was that some patients got exposed to the drug, but importantly, BC doctors or the Vancouver General Hospital doctors got to learn how to use the drug because, you know, it's kind of like when you see your doctor, you're probably wondering, he's too young. I'm not certain I want him to treat me because, you know, he probably doesn't have a lot of experience. Or what if you found out that this doctor had never given this drug before? You know, so one of the things that we doctors have to do is educate ourselves in terms of how to use that drug. And so that's one of the other things that these trials allows us to do. And so based upon our knowledge of how to give the drug, the situations to give it, you know, we were able to then advocate to the BCCA. So they funded in 2005 uh, for relapsed myeloma. And then eventually in 2010, they funded it for newly diagnosed non-transplant eligible patients. And then 2012, they funded it for patients who are pre-transplant. So in that sense, you know, this allowed us to kind of get ahead of the game in terms of our appreciation of this drug and to move forward with that. And in, of, of course, while this was going on, there continues to be tons of drug development. And so, um, you know, this is just a, uh, um, a cartoon um, uh, regarding this drug called carfilzomib. And carfilzomib is like a second generation Velcade. And uh, uh, for those of you who aren't aware, it's interesting because the name, why it's carfilzomib, like most of the drugs that you read about, you're scratching your head saying, who thought about this name for this drug? And well, you know, I don't know either, but this one is kind of you know, odd and interesting and, and funny. But the two guys who developed this drug was Carl and Phil. So that's why it's called carfilzomib. <laughs> and so you know, that makes it much more easier for me to remember that it's Carl and Phil. But, it's related to Velcade, and the way it works is that if you see that little cylinder, that's something that breaks down protein in our body, old proteins. Like, as you can imagine, for those of you who fix cars or renovate, when something's broken, you have to kind of get rid of it or recycle it or whatnot. So in our body, that happens all the time, too. So proteins in our body need to be broken down. And so this is what that proteasome does. And what carfilzomib does is that it kind of stops that carburetor from working. And in doing that, it allows these proteins, these bad proteins, to accumulate in the cell, which eventually leads to... Uh, um, uh, cell death. And that's essentially what happens in the plasma cells. So interestingly, preferentially, the plasma cells die. So this is a second generation drug. This drug has been available in the United States since 2012. Um, but in Canada, we're still waiting for its approval. So um, so with that, those classes of drugs, we've actually been uh, able to jump on the bandwagon to do a number of trials. I just want to point out two trials that we did. The, uh, one's published in JCO, which is one of the big uh, cancer journals, and the other one's uh, published in the American Journal of Hematology. And my colleague, Dr. Heather Sutherland, who I think some of you might have been treated uh, by, uh, and, you know, she you know, does the trials, or she's one of the PIs of the trials uh, as me. And so she helped spearhead some of these trials where they looked at the drug called pegylated liposomal doxorubicin, with bortezomib, another one where they looked at a drug called siltuximab with bortezomib, and it served two, two purposes. One is to try to see what these new drugs do, but the second was to try to get more of the Velcade to patients because it's a very expensive drug, and therefore there are certain limitations that we were encountering when we first got the drug available in British Columbia. So these are two of the trials that were, that were done. 
And I guess I had the luxury of participating in one of these uh, 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 trials with the second generation drug, carfilzomib. And this was published in Blood in 2012. And the people who got this drug were people who had had bortezomib or lenalidomide or thalidomide, and so didn't have many options. And so uh, we participated in the study, and, and, I, and, and I squared off my name, but I also underlined other names, which are Canadian authors. And, and, and I want to do that just to point out that the Canadian scene is actually very active in the world of multiple myeloma. And, and, and a lot of the landmark paper, papers actually do have Canadian names on them. And so what this demonstrated, and this is once again on the right-hand side survival curves, that people did have some benefit from this. And ba it's based upon this trial itself that the FDA, the Americans, approved the drugs and that the Americans can use the drug. So I find it ironic that, you know, you have all these Canadian authors there. We've used it, but we can't really get access to it because Health Canada has not gotten through Health Canada yet. And of course, the funding is not there. But it's part of our way of trying to become go ahead of the game to try to get used to these drugs, know how to use it, and try to advocate for these drugs to be approved. More recently, um, we also participate in a trial that's called the ASPIRE study. It's a phase three study, and as Cindy mentioned, what happens in a phase three study is that there's two groups, one that gets the regular drugs that you would typically get, and the other group that gets the regular drugs uh, plus you know, uh, the, the fancy drug. And so if you look down, you see the two boxes, the lenalidomide dex, which is the rev dex, and the lenalidomide dex plus carfilzomib, that's the study arm. And so this was published in, a, in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is a big journal for medicine, um, uh, by Dr. Keith Stewart, who actually used to work at the Princess Margaret Hospital, but is now at the Mayo Clinic in Arizona. And it showed that there was improvement in survival. And so based upon this study, the company, which is Amgen, who makes the drug, they're submitting it to Health Canada to get this drug approved. And so that's very exciting. And I can tell you that the, uh, uh, at least half a dozen of the big Canadian centers, including ours, participated in this study. Now, I also want to point out this study, which is called the Endeavor study. And the reason why I want to show you this study, with this is also a study with carfilzomib, is it's not a study that I, we are in Vancouver participated in. This is actually a study that, that uh, was uh, um, open in uh, cancer, uh, sorry, BCCA Southern Interior. So Dr. Greg Duick. So Dr. Greg Duick was an investigator on this study. And in this one, they were testing carfilzomib versus uh, bortezomib in a certain uh, population. And this showed improvement with carfilzomib. And so this is another uh, study. Uh, so, so the file that Amgen will submit for carfilzomib is based upon this study as well as a previous study. Now, I do want to slightly go off on a tangent because I know the questions were coming out regarding how do I get these get on these trials locally and that kind of stuff. Um, just to give you a little bit more of an answer on this, obviously, if, you're coming to, if you want to come to Vancouver for trials, the difficulty is that if you're getting an injection, you can only get into Vancouver, and so it's really difficult. So unless you, you move to Vancouver, pretty much, it's very hard to be on an injection trial in Vancouver. If you have a pill trial where you come once a month, that's sometimes feasible. So the truth is, the only real way to be on a trial that is intensive is that it has to be close to home for better or for worse. So this is a trial that was done closer to home. So for, for somebody who lived in, this, in, 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 in the Okanagan, this would have been a trial that, that, that you could have gone on if, if, if uh, you were eligible at that time that it was open. Now this study is now closed, but I know that Dr. Duick is uh, uh, continuing to look for myeloma trials for his population too. So this is another carfilzomib trial that we currently have available in, 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 in Vancouver. And it's also opening up in Kelowna in the next couple of weeks. I just uh, uh, contacted Dr. Duick regarding this trial a couple of weeks ago. So, um, so uh, what happens uh, 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 in those situations that we may submit to the same ethics board because we have to prove to the ethicists that it's ethical to do these trials, but the trials are actually considered, trial centers are actually considered separate, meaning that if I treat someone in Vancouver they, and they wanted to move to Kelowna they would essentially have to come back to Vancouver to get the drug. They, we can't transfer them over to Kelowna for the trial itself because we're considered separate centers. So it is actually quite a challenge, to be perfectly honest with you, or with the geography of, of, of our country. And I say our country because our country is huge, and this is not only a challenge for BC people, but it's also a challenge for people in Quebec or Ontario because those are huge provinces as well, too. So the best that we can do in British Columbia is to try to have the other centers open up trials. And so fortunately for this trial, Dr. Duick is opening up in Kelowna as well too. So this is 
where people are getting carfilzomib either weekly or twice weekly because they're trying to find out whether if you can give a high dose once a week, whether that's the same as giving low doses two times a week. Because it's obviously more convenient to get the drug once a week versus twice a week if it's an injection. And that, although not exciting, on a practical level is extremely important. Um, for instance, you could live in a place like um, you know, um, shoe shop or whatnot, and maybe this is the closest center, and you have to drive a bunch of hours to come here, wouldn't it be great if you could just come once a week versus twice a week? So this has practical implications. So this is actually, I think, an important trial. But the other importance of this trial is we myeloma doctors want carfilzomib for our patients. If we can't get it through the government because the government says no or there's no funding, then the only other way we can do it is through clinical trials. So this is what we are trying to do to support the needs of, of, of the patients who may have myeloma. Of course, as I said, it's not helpful for someone who lives in Prince George, for instance, because they can't fly down regularly to Kelowna or to, or to Vancouver for it. But at least at a minimum, some BC patients get it and the BC doctors begin to learn how to use it. So carfilzomib is available in the United States, not available in Canada, but with the data from some of these trials, the company is submitting to Health Canada, and we're in regular discussions with them to try to help them do this. But then once Health Canada does approve it, we'll then have the other big barrier, which is how will we pay for it? This drug is going to be $10,000 to $15,000 a month. It's not cheap. And so this is a reality that I think that we need to um, be honest about because, you know, you are here because you have myeloma, but I heard a gentleman talk about his wife who had a brain tumor. You'll have other people who have breast cancer, or colon cancer, and oncology drugs are all coming in at about ten to fifteen thousand dollars a month, and some twenty thousand dollars a month. And you have to ask yourself how we can pay pay for that as a society. I don't have an answer for that, but this is a serious question, and you're seeing that in the papers all the time. So another exciting drug that's ha uh, that that that, uh, that is being used is a drug called Ixazomib. And this is also a protozoan inhibitor. It's like Velcade or Bortezomib. It's developed by the same people who developed Bortezomib, except that it's a pill. And wouldn't that be great? Because then you wouldn't have to come for the injections regularly. So we've done a number of trials in this. One of the trials that we did were some newly diagnosed patients where we combined it with the older drugs of melphalan and prednisone. And so this, we enrolled some patients on it, and we're waiting for results on this. And we also did another exazomib trial. Once again, this one was a phase three, where we had one group that got standard drugs and the other group that got the standard with this new fancy drug. And it was in patients who had relapsed multiple myeloma. And this trial, which we finished enrolling about a year to two years ago, the data needed to mature, but they're finally gonna present it at ASH, which is the American Society of Hematology meeting, which that's gonna happen next week in Orlando. And this is our big meeting, and they're gonna, sh and they're gonna the data that's come out is that it improves um, the time where you don't have your myeloma being active for a, an extra six months. Um, we don't know whether people live longer in the end, but at least it keeps the myeloma away for six more months. And based upon this trial, which we participated in as well too, they applied to the American government or the FDA, or the, and the FDA gave approval for this drug just this week. So in the United States, they will be able to prescribe this drug without being on a trial. And of course, at some point, the companies will hopefully begin to make applications to the Canadian government. This drug is also exciting for other areas, and one of them is amyloidosis. Most of you won't know what amyloidosis is. Some of you might, but it's a related condition to multiple myeloma, and it works re and and. Bortezomib or Velcade works really, really well for it. So they're trying to see whether Ixazomib works well as well too. And so once again, because it's a pill, the hope is that it will work really, really well. And so this is a study that we're, we currently have open in Vancouver as well too. Now I did mention to you that the, the one of the big classes of drugs that we have available are the uh, immunomodulatory drugs. And I just wanted to show you the three that we have available to us currently. The old drug thalidomide, which uh, is still used in parts of the world for myeloma. Very good, but uh, um, has uh, certain side effects that make it uh, uh, less desirable to use. And the one in the middle is lenalidomide or revlimid, and that's the one we use uh, more regularly. And then pomalidomide, which just got approved earlier this year. And so they have, they're very similar in many ways, but they're also very different in many ways in terms of how they work and side effects that they have. But it's great that we do have these options because in addition to the fact that they work really well, um, you know, they're pills, so they make life a lot more convenient. So the, how do these drugs work? The truth is that we don't really know. 
And I'll be honest with you, you know, having gone to a lot of these meetings and talking about a lot of these drugs, it's very interesting and fancy the way they show how all these drugs work. The bottom line is we really don't know how a lot of these drugs work, even though they've got some of the stuff worked out. Whether, it, whether these drugs kill the myeloma cells directly or whether they actually affect the blood vessels that go and supply to the uh, myeloma cells, we don't really know, or whether they affect how it interacts with the rest of your immune system, we don't really know. But that's some of the possible mechanisms. More recently, there's a protein called Cerebron that's being looked at, and that seems to be where really the money is. So there's still a lot of research regarding how these drugs work. Now, we do have these drugs approved, but we have to get to the point of approval. And I want to show you some of the work that happened over the past number of years to get to that spot. So this is a phase two trial, so a large number of patients, but not too large. And this is a trial that we in Vancouver participated in. And once again, I outlined other Canadian centers to point out once again that Canadian centers are very active in these areas. And this was a phase two trial, and this was published in Blood in 2014. But the study had enough data that led to the drug to be approved in the United States around 2012 as well too. So once again, we had a great trial with a lot of Canadian centers and the drug got approved. And you know, I found myself once again, that frustrating situation of having used this drug multiple times but not being able to give this drug regularly. So they had this other large trial that happened subsequently, and this is uh, um, another pomalidomide trial, and this was a phase three trial. So this was a trial where people have had to have Velcade or bortezomib and then Revlimid, and if it didn't work, then they were allowed to go on this trial. And so what happened was that they were randomized. So once again, this is a phase three trial where the standard, we didn't know what the best standard was, so um, you know, they ultimately decided they would just give dexamethasone as a standard. Or if you were lucky enough to fall into the group that got the pomalidomide drug, then you got pomalidomide and low-dose dexamethasone. So, you know, we put a number of patients. Unfortunately, like virtually everybody got the pomalidomide other than, you know, two, two patients, I think. And so I was very happy about that. Um, we did the trial. We, we, we saw how things went. And ultimately, it did show that patients had improved survival. So they lived longer if they got pomalidomide. They also had a longer time with the disease being away as well too. And so this is the trial, the large phase three trial where you had a standard arm and versus the, the study drug. It was published in 2013 and this is a trial based upon which the drug was approved by Health Canada and then led to funding by the BCCA. And so I didn't underline the names, but there's a bunch of Canadian names again, once again there. So we are, you know, it's, 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 our, it's, it's our desire to be on these trials as quickly as possible so we can get uh, these drugs to the patient to be involved in these trials and eventually lead to this drug being uh, available to, uh, to uh, British Columbians and Canadians. So we are still doing more pomalidomide trials because obviously, as I mentioned to you, you can, tr you can try these drugs in many different settings and many different combinations. So we have this tr uh, trial called the Plexus trial with pomalidomide. And in this trial, we're trying to use pomalidomide earlier, so before you've had too many treatments to see whether it has an increased uh, benefit in that, those situations. So this is a trial that's currently open and, and ongoing. Another interesting trial that happened with a drug that we currently have available is, uh, is the first trial. So Revlimid or lenalidomide, uh, a lot of you have heard about that. And the current approval for Revlimid or lenalidomide, that drug, it's funded for if you had a treatment and then that treatment stops working, then you can go get it as a second line treatment. And that's how it's funded across the country. And as was mentioned by Francine, in certain parts of the country, they took a long time before they got there. The question is, as opposed to waiting until you've had another treatment, could you use it really as the first treatment and would you get just as much benefit? So once again, a drug we have available but used in a different setting and that leads to this trial, which is a phase three trial. And in this trial, they had three arms, one where they got the Revlimid with dexamethasone until your disease got worse. In the second arm, they had it just for 18 months and then they stopped to see what would happen. And third arm, they had an old combination of malfalan prednisone plus thalidomide. And so the pub, uh, this, this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2014, which showed that if you got Revlimid continuously, the disease stayed away for much longer. And so uh, this is, uh, uh, based upon this, there, there's filings that are ongoing to see if we can get the drug earlier in the disease course, because there's obviously the added convenience as well, too, because wouldn't it be great if when you were diagnosed, you were told, here, take this pill, 
and you know you could come back in a month and we'll see how you're doing versus you got to come back here every week to be assessed and this and this because when you have myeloma it can be very hard to travel back and forth as you know so once again you know this is a very exciting trial and this is leading to hopefully eventual approval of this drug and as I mentioned to you before you know we enrolled patients on this and there were a number of other Canadian investigators on these trials so those are trials with drugs that you currently are uh, aware of so you know, what are the, some of the newer drugs that, are, that, that, that we have available? One of the exciting areas is actually monoclonal antibodies. Um, it's a bit of a mouthful, but antibodies are things that our body already produces when we have an infection like a virus in our body or even a bacteria, and sometimes we think maybe cancer. Our immune system actually gets rid of it. That's how we recover from, you know, infections like viral infections. Well, what if we had an antibody that could actually attack the cancer and so that's what people are working on quite a bit. It's already available for a lot of other conditions, like if you have lymphoma, there's a drug called rituximab, or if there's breast cancer, you have her Herceptin. We're trying to look for one in multiple myeloma. And so the exciting drug that's coming out is this drug called daratumumab. And uh, this is what we call a waterfall plot. And they tried this drug as a single agent in patients who had multiple myeloma who really didn't have many options. Now. What they measured was a protein in their blood, and if your protein went down, then the bars that are going down shows how far it went down, with minus 100 way at the bottom, meaning that your protein totally disappeared. If your protein went up, meaning that you weren't responding, the bars went up. So if you look here, you can see that more of the bars went down than went up with this drug for people who had really not many options for multiple myeloma. So this was very exciting because by the time you get to have been treated so many times, most people expect that they won't respond to anything. But lo and behold, this drug seems to be very exciting because they're having some type of response. So we were involved in a study where we Part, where, where we gave this drug to patients who really didn't have many options. And so this study uh, confirmed the initial studies and was presented uh, uh, at the American Society, of Hematology, sorry, American Society of Clinical Oncology meeting in Chicago in the summer. And it will soon be published in one of the prominent medical journals as well, too. So it was very exciting for us to be participants in this trial. Now, uh, just on a slightly off on a tangent, what was happening was that when this tr these trials were getting on board, a lot of Canadian centers were excited to do this trial, Vancouver, Calgary, Edmonton, Toronto, and we were offered and promised that we would be a part of the group that would actually do this trial. But then what happened was that there were so many people who were excited because it was also being done in Europe, that they said, you know what, we're just going to focus on the Europeans because Canadians are a small market. So they pretty much said, you know what, we're not going to let you participate in this trial because we want to give it all to the Spanish and to the, uh, the Dutch and whatnot. So what happened was that all the Canadian doctors got really, really upset. And with the help of Aldo Del Col, who is uh, um, the, the scientific director of Myeloma Canada, Aldo managed to organize us such that we kind of put the squeeze on the people who are making this drug. And with a lot of pressure, what ended up happening is they came back to us and said, you know what, we made a mistake. This is not the right thing. We offered it to you. You guys can get back your slots to put people on these trials. And so this is one of the things that I think is important to know that Myeloma Canada does, which is it helps organize Canadian physicians that way. And so because of that effort, we got back on the trial and we put a bunch of patients in there. And importantly, you know, when the publications come out, you'll see that there are a number of Canadian authors on this trial. So this is just an example, once again, of how deep the remissions uh, uh, patients can get when they're on this trial. I'll have you, so these are, these bars show the people who responded. If you look on the far left, you'll see zero to about 30%. So when patients have had so much exposure to other drugs, when you get 30% response, we're really actually quite excited about this drug. So this is, a, this is a very exciting drug, and I think we'll see a lot more of this drug in the near future. And so based upon that earlier trial, and because in Vancouver we were able to enroll enough patients, that allowed us to participate in this other phase three trial, which is designed very similarly to previous ones that I presented, where you're getting the standard of relvimid and dexamethasone versus the relvimid dexamethasone plus the study drug, which is daratumumab. And this study enrolled relatively quickly. We enrolled a, a number of patients at our center too, and we're just waiting for the results to come out. It'll probably take at least another year, or so um, you know, you know, by the end of next year, perhaps we'll have some preliminary results. But we're we're waiting in anticipation for these results. I just want to point out, though, that based upon this trial here, which showed these results, the Americans submitted that to their FDA, and the FDA approved the drug 
So in the US, you can begin prescribing this drug off trial. In Canada, because of the way our health care, uh, Health Canada works and the type of data that they want, um, it's going to probably take us a number of years beyond that for us to get the drug through Health Canada and then fund it is another story as well too, of course. So I know that for some of you who do look at the internet, you'll see that in America you have all these options, but we have less options in Canada and in Europe because Europe is very similar to Canada in terms of how their approval process goes. But once again, I do want to point out that you know, that, that this is uh, uh, our way of Canadian uh, uh, investigators to try to jump on the bandwagon, to try to get these drugs as quickly as possible so that we can uh, be involved in these trials but also have experience with these drugs. Now, uh, there's a molecule called brintuximab vidotin. It's another big mouthful, but the bottom line is this is an, an antibody. But an antibody targets the cancer cell, but attached to this antibody is actually a poison called MMAAE. And this drug, brintuximab, is against CD30. Now, this is not for multiple myeloma, but actually it's currently used for another condition called Hodgkin's lymphoma. And this has been the biggest drug in Hodgkin's lymphoma for the past generation. It's very, very exciting. So based upon the results that they're getting Hodgkin's lymphoma, the company is adjusting the molecule to see if this is going to work in multiple myeloma. And so we have a study, and Cindy was mentioning that, it's a phase one study that is going to be opening up hopefully very soon in Vancouver. It's not open yet. So it's a phase one study, and you know, as Cindy mentioned, you know, we kind of call it first in man, but you know, it's been relatively well tested. So, 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 so I think that if, you, if, if someone goes on the study, they shouldn't be so scared that they're going to die uh, uh, um, in the first dose. But rather, we're, we're trying to find out what is the most tolerable dose at this point. Uh, so this is a study that's currently open in Toronto, and we're soon to open, hopefully, and that we'll be able to test out this molecule. The problem with phase one studies is that you don't know how far they'll get. They may never get to phase three, two, or phase three. And I think that's important to know because when you do go to look for clinical trials across the world and stuff, you'll see that there's a lot of phase ones. And phase ones are about as far as you can get from getting it into general approval. Uh, um, so, so phase ones are, are pretty distant. And they have a lot of phase ones that are going on in the US. And for us, we try to, if we do phase ones, we try to choose ones that we think has the biggest chance of working. So this is gonna be a very exciting molecule for us to test out. Um, we've also participated in this other study, once again, with a drug called panobinostat, which is an HDAC inhibitor. And, um, you know, this was, uh, this, this publication came out of the Journal of Clinical Oncology uh, not too long ago. And then there's a phase three study in the Lancet Oncology in 2015. And it, based upon these studies, the drug was recently approved in the U.S., probably take a lot longer in Canada. And I apologize. I know I've been saying that repetitively, but it's just that, you know, we are a different country. So this goes on to uh, the MCRN. This was mentioned by uh, Francine regarding the Myeloma Canada group. So what happened in 2005 was that Aldo created Myeloma Canada, and then with that, uh, and John Lemieux as well too, and then with that, eventually he began to engage the Canadian physicians. And so he began to, the question was, why can these Americans and Europeans get together as a group, and why can't we as Canadians? Because Canadians are much nicer people, you know? We get along, you know, you know, you know, if, 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 if someone does, you know, like for instance, and, and you can shoot me if you don't agree with me, but I don't think a Donald Trump could be elected in, in, in Canada because he's just too brash, you know? Yeah. You know, you know uh, we might think that some of his thoughts are okay, but we just, his style is just, just not Canadian style. So why can't we Canadians get together like the Americans? And so Aldo, uh, you know, really got us together because we know each other. We don't always sit around the table with each other, but we all like each other, we know each other. So Aldo kind of, you know, got us together and said, hey, you know what, we need to do this in Canada as well too. So he organized uh, these things and gradually this has been building momentum over the past 10 years. And as uh, Francine pointed out, you know, we've got all these centers across uh, Canada who have jumped on board. And it's not to say that we'll do everything, everybody will do everything together because, you know, when you have 16, you don't have to have everybody doing everything as long as you have half of them do one, half of them do the other and mix and match of that. So that's really what our whole goal is to have enough of a momentum, not necessarily everybody, to be able to do a lot of trials. And that's what we hope in the future. So here we have Vancouver, you know, Calgary, Edmonton, you know, further on down, you've got all these uh, uh, Ontario centers, St. John's, Newfoundland. So, you know, we met in, in uh, not too long ago to talk about initiatives, uh, and I think that was very, very exciting because, you know, it's great to see that so many people are interested in myeloma. 
So one of the trials that uh, we're doing, um, based upon some of our meetings, we call it the MCRN1 trial one because this is really the first trial where our group got together and agreed to do this. And this is where we're looking at different conditioning regimens for transplant. So as you know, for those of you who've had an autologous stem cell transplant, you get the chemotherapy on one day, and then you get your stem cell transplant the next day. So the question is, if we added another drug to this one day of chemotherapy, would that make a difference? And that's part of uh, what this trial is doing. The second thing is we're doing is that we're also doing a lot of bone marrow biopsies because one of the other questions that, for those of you who follow myeloma, is is there a better way to follow people than just blood, like the bone marrow and that kind of stuff, because funny things can happen. And so we're testing all of these things out, and I think that's really exciting because it's not just drug therapeutics, but it's the biology of the disease that we're trying to understand. And so I think that's it's, it's really, really exciting that we're all doing this together. And this trial is almost closed, essentially, so we should have uh, these results are being presented and, and, and is maturing over time. Another uh, myeloma study, the uh, Myeloma Canada study that we're going to be doing, uh, and it's going to open up very soon, is with this drug called Selenexor. It's, it's really a drug of a different class dealing with uh, something called a nuclear export compound. And uh, the bottom line is we think that if we combine it with other drugs, you know, there'll be more than an additive uh, effect. There'll be maybe multiplicative. So it's not 2 plus 2 is equal to 4. Rather, 2 plus 2, it might be 2 times 2 is equal to, sorry, 2 is probably not the best one to do, but, you know, 3 times 3 is 9 versus, you know, 3 plus 3 is 6 type of thing. So we're, we're trying this combination. And so this study uh, uh, um, is going to be tested, uh, this drug is going to be tested with pomalidomide and dexamethasone, lenalidomide and dexamethasone, and bortezomib and dexamethasone. And, these, and so, so hopefully we'll have this trial open in the next uh, couple of months in, in Vancouver. And so um, uh, this is very exciting for us. And, and really, I think that uh, the company looked at uh, Myeloma Canada or the MCRN, Myeloma Canada Research Network as uh, being a very organized group to try to get this done as quickly as possible. And so I think in that sense, we as a group, we're building some momentum. So we're obviously looking at other trials, and uh, uh, this is how we interact with industry to try to bring what we think are the best ideas together for the Canadian environment. So the third trial that uh, the, 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 the group is trying to embark on is where they're getting a carfilzomib that I mentioned before with cyclophosphamide and dexamethasone. Um, Sorry, it shouldn't be KRD, it should be KCD. Um, but uh, Dr. Venner and Dr. Belch uh, in Edmonton are spearheading this effort. Uh, as I mentioned to you before, it doesn't mean that every center participates. And uh, unfortunately, our group, we're not participating in this one because we have a study that's very similar to it, which is the Arrow study that I mentioned. But we do have all these other Canadian sites that are uh, jumping on board for this one too. And then, you know, uh, other drugs, other, other trials that are in the concept phase, meaning that we're just thinking about it and we're just trying to get some buy-in from industry and other funding agencies. Um, you know, Dr. Seabag in Montreal is trying to get a trial that has a daratumumab involved. And then Dr. Zapita in Calgary is wondering about whether we could use that exazomib drug with other, other uh, uh, available drugs involved. And then there's drugs that are further down the pipeline where initial discussions are being had. So, so hopefully uh, um, this uh, uh, um, evolution of this trial group uh, will uh, continue and will become an incredibly robust entity in the future. So uh, importantly, as uh, Francine mentioned with Myeloma Canada, it's not just getting the doctors together at a table to say, let's do this. In fact, we have to get industry involved because, as, you, as I mentioned to you, these drugs are very expensive. The companies have to be willing to share the drugs with us because the drugs may not be approved in Canada. We also have to involve uh, uh, people who do uh, research in terms of the cells, the biology, you know, looking at these cells uh, with, us, uh, with uh, laboratory instruments and stuff. We also have to get people who can help the organizational aspect of things because, you know, when you're on a study, people have to measure X, Y, and Z of your blood and that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of linkages that we have to do and this is what uh, the Myeloma Canada Research Network uh, uh, is created for. So I've, I've mentioned this many times, but uh, uh, I, I, I'm coming to the end of my talk. Um, I think it's important to mention why we do studies. Um, so the treatment of multiple myeloma is rapidly changing. Newer drugs are being developed all the time. Um, and these drugs may be approved later in BC and Canada and other parts of the world. And really in other parts of the world, I should probably put more the US because in general, you know, and this is, you know, US is the big partner uh, down south. You know, that's what we always compare ourselves to because we don't compare ourselves to Jamaica, for instance, because, you know, in Jamaica um, yeah, or, or poorer countries, you know, such as, um, you know, Nepal or whatnot, I'm certain that lenalidomide or Revlimid would be very hard to get. But we're always asking, why is the US getting this before us? So for us, we might get it later than the US. 
also these drugs are expensive. Um, so, you know, we, we need to jump on the bandwagon to try to get these drugs to as many people as we can as possible. And uh, keeping in mind, of course, that we can't get it to everybody. And unfortunately, there's an issue of, of geography as well, too, that we, that we can't, uh, you know, easily address. The other thing that's really important is that as we do more trials, as we put patients on the trials, we are then seen as centers that are very good at these kind of stuff. And the better we are, the more people want us to do these things. It's like if you're going to have uh, somebody do your plumbing, you're going to find the guy who does a lot of plumbing, not the guy who hardly ever does plumbing, because you want it to be done right the first time. So companies will approach centers that do it well. And so the Canadian centers typically do things well. So I think we've managed to show a track record and attract companies to come to us and say, hey, we want you guys to try our drugs. How do we decide on trials? So first of all, we have to be off for the trials. Um, and as I mentioned, this sometimes has to do with prior exposure to the sponsors like Celgene. We have a good relationship with them, and so they are always thinking about us. And Celgene has a strong uh, presence in Canada, as does other companies like Janssen and uh, uh, Novartis. You know, we know them well, so they know uh, our strengths. Um, sometimes there are companies that don't really know us well, and then we have to approach them. Uh, because if there's a drug that's really exciting, but the company is very small or they don't have a Canadian presence, then we have to approach them. And in our approach of them, it's always better if we can approach them with strengths, and strengths come in number. And that's where the MCRN may play, play into it quite a bit. As we find out what drugs we like, we select them because based upon most likely benefit, that we obviously want to try a drug that we think has a good chance of working, not one that's going to fail. It also has to be relatively convenient. So if we have a pill, that might be more attractive than intravenous. And so those are the things that we have to think about. Also, we have to avoid competing trials, meaning that you know, we can only do so many trials, but if we have a trial that services the same population, for instance, let's say we had a trial for patients who are just diagnosed with myeloma but were not transplantable, meaning that they're older. We typically only have one trial in that setting, not two or three, because they will compete against each other. And what does competition within the center do? It means that we may have three trials and they may not enroll a lot of patients because they're all spread out. If they don't enroll a lot of patients, then the companies are upset. We don't get good experience with the drugs. Also, we lose a lot of money on those things because, as I mentioned to you earlier on, we have to be able to make money, break even, blah, 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 blah. So we try to avoid competing trials. And why I mentioned that is because you might go on the internet and find out there's a whole, whole bunch of trials and you're saying, there's 500 trials. Why is BC or Vancouver only offering five? And why is the, uh, you know, the MD Anderson or the uh, Mayo Clinic offering 15? That's part of the reason why we have to do that. The other is, issue is that we have to sustain the, the trials unit. And this is, unfortunately, the reality of it. There is a financial aspect to it, too. Because if we are in the red, eventually our trials unit will close. We have to be able to pay the nurses to be able to do their work and stuff. The money has to come from somewhere. So we have to make it through the, uh, through the research that we do. And if we make a lot of money, then we can do other trials that might lose a lot of money. So we have to think about the sustainability of our unit. And that's how we, uh, that's how we, that's how we select our trials. Our trials uh, being done outside of the Vancouver General Hospital uh, in BC. And I think that's an important question because it goes back to your question of, well, if you're doing it in Vancouver, why can't you, I just see you once a year and I get all of my treatment in Prince George? Well, as I explained to you, Prince George Hospital, unfortunately, is not the Vancouver General Hospital. They have different contracting rules and stuff like that. So the best way for us to get around this is to have the local centers do clinical trials. So um, understandably, Vancouver is the big city, Kelowna is smaller, Victoria is smaller as well too. So they have different abilities to do to trials. So we'll always have more uh, 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 trials that are done at our centers and smaller BCCA centers. But as I mentioned to you before, there are trials that are being done in Kelowna as well too, and Dr. Duick is certainly doing his best to try to bring the ones that are feasible to uh, the interior. This is just a, uh, um, uh, a slide which shows you uh, the various uh, centers in, uh, in BC. That star is uh, the Vancouver General Hospital, and we, the Vancouver General Hospital, serve as the BCCA Vancouver, because you do know that there is a BCCA site in Vancouver. They're not the Vancouver General Hospital. I am a BCCA employee, but I work at the Vancouver General because of the transplant and because the small BCCA hospitals can't do transplants. But we do all the myeloma, so we serve as the BCCA site, if you want to call it that. So we're the big star because we are, you know, the big center. And then you have 
Victoria, Kelowna, Abbotsford, and you have the center uh, of the north that recently opened up. And so hopefully the other BCCA sites will be able to at some point have the ability to do clinical trials in myeloma as well too. And there was one trial that I mentioned to you called the FIRST trial, and when we did the FIRST trial, that was actually open in Victoria, uh, Vancouver, uh, Fraser Valley, which is Surrey, and, and Kelowna. So sometimes there are trials that smaller centers can participate in. How about outside of BC? You may be in a situation where you want to go somewhere else for a trial, like Calgary, for instance. And you know, certainly Kelowna is one of those places where it might be easier for you to actually fly to Calgary than to fly to Vancouver because you actually have family in Calgary and you don't have family in Vancouver. So, you know, if you if you find information on, on a center in Calgary, they could probably and they would be willing to treat you. Um, you have to deal with, unfortunately, the issues of travels and the accommodations because you know Calgary is still not home for people here. Um, but unfortunately, if you're in a trial in Calgary, you have to get most of the stuff done in Calgary, as Cindy had mentioned. So that's a reality that you have to think about when you think about this. Um, the second is that if you are in Canada, at least you can get some of the stuff covered, meaning that your healthcare costs. Let's say you were on a trial in Calgary and you got sick in Calgary and you went to the Foothills Hospital and you were admitted, you would be taken care of. You're a Canadian, you have a BC healthcare, the governments or the health bodies will move the money around. You don't have to worry about that. But if you decided that, hey, you know what? I really want a trial to, uh, that, that, that I have at the Mayo Clinic. Well, you have to deal with that issue as well, too. It's not just travel accommodations, but if you get sick and you're there, then they have to deal with it and you have to pay for it. Um, and that's a real issue. Um, the other difficulty is that, you know what, I want to go to a trial at the Mayo Clinic, and I think the government should pay for that because, you know, this is a trial that's really exciting and everybody says it's the best thing to do. The problem is that clinical trials are not considered standard treatment, so the government will not pay for this kind of stuff. And I think that that's a, an, an important issue that, unfortunately, we have to deal with. So, you know, yes, there are trials that are outside of British Columbia, Vancouver, Kelowna, and it is not unreasonable to look for them, but you just have to go in there with your eyes wide open. So finally, um, you know, there is improved survival uh, with these newer drugs, and I've shown you data regarding that. Hopefully with the, even the more newer drugs, we'll have continuous improvement. Um, clinical trials help us access the drugs, it allows earlier availability, it increases the physician's experience with the drugs, and also allows us to be stronger in our advocacy and in our applications. So when we say to Health Canada or to the BCCA, listen, we gotta get this drug, it's really good. You know, people tolerate really well, they live a lot longer. It's easier for me to say that if I've actually used that drug than saying, well, I've read these reports and they say it's good, so that's why you should do it. So that's the other big reason why we do it. But clinical trials are not easy to do. They're very challenging. It requires a lot of infrastructure. And when you see that research nurse who is taking care of you for a clinical trial, you don't see all the people behind her who are actually allowing that to happen. It takes a lot of work to get there. And so in that sense, um, you know, um, sometimes it can be frustrating because you think that, hey, this clinical trial looks good for me. Why can't I start it tomorrow, for instance? Uh, and why can't I start it, you know, in Kelowna versus going to other centers or whatnot? Uh, they're not simple. And nowadays, they're, I find it getting increasingly challenging. Um, you know, you get all of these reports about side effects and stuff like that and, and this that you have to deal with. So the amount of paperwork is becoming really, really huge. So, you know, I think that, um, you know, uh, in that sense, uh, the clinical trials are, are not so straightforward to do. But, you know, we live in exciting times, and I think for particular for multiple myeloma, and I think that really for multiple myeloma, this is the golden age of, of drug development. So, so it is very exciting regarding where we're at right now. So finally, this is just a slide of acknowledgements. I wanted to mention to you the physicians that I work with at uh, the Leukemia BMT program. All of them uh, participate in the trials that I do. And I said the only reason why I'm better known is because, you know, you know, I travel a bit more, and I guess I and, and, and talk a little bit more, but uh, they're just all just as good. Uh, I do want to mention the lymphoma group. Uh, some of you may know Joe Connors or Lori Sen, and they've been really important people for me to deal with to try to get things through. The research nurses are fabulous, and Cindy, uh, uh, you know, is, 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 is well known, not just in this country, but outside of this country regarding the things that she's done for multiple myeloma. So it's really, uh, she's probably more important than I am in terms of the myeloma community at this point. So uh, she's great. I want to also acknowledge the uh, physicians who are at uh, uh, Kelowna because they're really great docs. I know all of them, and I think you are lucky to have uh, such uh, a great 
and in my opinion, relatively young group, but they're very, very good doctors. Uh, Myeloma Canada, Francine and Aldo, who've uh, worked uh, you know really hard to get us where we're at. Obviously, the the patients uh, um, you know are important because you know it's all at the end of the day for you. But also because interestingly, as I mentioned to you, the reason why our clinical trials unit got started was from the donations of primarily myeloma donors who are who are relatively wealthy. And then, of course, all the organizations that help us, and then industry, you know, these pharmaceutical industries are, uh, you know, without them, obviously, we wouldn't have any progress at this point. Well, that's it. Um, any questions? Ten years ago in Calgary, and it was based on uh, like a virus. What they do is they inject the virus into the mainstream, and this virus arrests the particular molecular cancer, as it were, to, in especially in inoperable areas. In what? Sorry. In in operable areas, like where you can't operate and and get the tumor out without. Uh, so I can't, I can't comment really on cancers that are not multiple myeloma. I apologize. You know, we're very specialized in what we do nowadays. Mm -hmm. So I can't comment on brain tumors or, uh, or uh, for instance, like breast cancer. And, and so uh, um, the particular incidents that you're talking about, I'm, I'm not certain exactly what that might be. But I do know that the uh, uh, Alberta group, they're working with something called the, the, the Rio virus. And they've been working on that for a number of years. Uh, it's, it's come and gone in terms of what I've seen in their literature. And they've been doing some stuff on myeloma. So I, I don't really know where that's headed you know there was you know there's some possibilities but you know the difficulty is that there's so many things that are going on um, that it's really hard to comment where something like that might be placed um, but but I do know that they've been working on some virus technology at least for the past decade and that might be the one that you're talking about but in multiple myeloma that's not at the point where we're anywhere close to, to using that so it's not not really applicable in that case well, you know, there's there's things that are applicable a year from now, five years from now, and ten years from now type of thing. So I think that one is still at the stage where they really have to figure out uh, whether this works and what diseases that it works for. Because my understanding is when they were looking at they were looking at across many different diseases. But, you know, the thing is that there's so many things that are just ripe for the picking of myeloma that that probably is a little bit further down the list. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, uh, does that still apply now that it's on the market? It's a good question. I know, there's, I know there's stiffer parameters when you're going into a trial. It's a good question, and I think Cynthia might have dealt with some of the eligibility issues. So uh, as a part of the eligibility, you have to have adequate kidneys, and you have to have adequate blood counts, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. And the reason why they do that is that you know, depending on the trial, for most trials, they want to be able to assess how well the drug works. And if you have someone who's on the verge of death, it's not going to be helpful in the sense that, you know, people who are sick, very sick, tend not to do well. And the last thing that they want to do is give it to them because if somebody dies while they're getting a study drug, then all of a sudden the question is, is it the drug that killed them? And then and then it just really makes it very hard to move drug development forward. So a lot of drug development happens in a very narrow, relatively healthy population. Now your question is, once a drug is uh, available, available, can it go outside of that? Is it not the patient's decision? Can they try it? Whether they... So that's a good question. So it all depends on what the funding bodies allow. Because you know the thing is that what happens with a drug is that certain drugs are funded in certain indications. And it might be that you will not be allowed to get that drug at a certain kidney function because the studies just aren't there. And so based upon that, the government projects how many people would be eligible and how many people would not be eligible. And to go outside that limit is not so straightforward. And you're right in a certain sense that physicians, uh, patients should have that prerogative to make a decision. But the counterpart to that is physicians don't want to give a drug that's going to harm a person. For instance, if you came to someone and said, listen, you know, I've got this heart problem and I need heart surgery, and the physician saw you and said, I think if I did it, your chances of dying is 80%. You can't say, well, that's my decision. The doctor might just say, you know what, it might be your decision, but I need to offer it to you and I'm not offering it to you. 
And so with a drug, uh, there's a bit of both, but on the other hand, for things like palmolidomide, for instance, we might feel that there is data that goes beyond what the trial says to allow us to stretch that indication. So I think it has to do with what the individual. every individual is different and every physician will be different. And drugs now, partially because they're so expensive, are approved for certain indication. Going back to your question, what if you said to the doctor, I heard the pomalidomide is the best myeloma drug. I was diagnosed with myeloma yesterday. I want it now. The answer would be no, not because it will kill you, but because the funding bodies have not approved it for that because there's no data on that, but also because the company has not studied it at that level, for instance. So there is a certain degree of choice, but unfortunately it's not as broad as you'd like it to be. But if you've been through all of the available drugs and yeah. been refractory to all of yeah. them, and, and, that, and, that, and, that's a, and that's a good question, and, and there's no straightforward answer to that, unfortunately. Yeah. Thanks. More questions? Anyone? Yeah. Uh, I have a friend that's in the Seattle and just came through the stem cell. In follow-up uh, to her, they do a regular um, bone marrow biopsy and watching some different proteins, but here we're only doing, kind of watching uh, my light chains. Can you speak to that? Why would there be a difference? Different centers have different uh, uh, practices, and there will be variances, in, even, if the, even though the majority of the way the approach is similar. For instance, if you're in Calgary, they'll probably do a bio bone marrow biopsy roughly about three months afterwards because it's part of our definition of remission status, particularly if you have what we call a complete, complete remission. And you know, one could argue that's the right thing to do. One could argue, that, uh, the, but the counter argument is, does that make a difference in terms of what you're gonna do? Because one of the th issues is, for every test, the question is, what value does it add to the fork in the road. Is there a fork in the road? Are we gonna change treatment based upon that test, particularly when it's an invasive test? If I told you that I'd like to do a bone marrow biopsy every three months to see how you're doing, and you told me, is that gonna make any difference to what you're gonna to do to me? And I said, no, but that's what I should do. You're gonna walk away saying, I don't really know if I wanna do this, because bone marrow biopsies are not comfortable. On the other hand, if I said, I'm gonna do a blood test every month, I probably won't do anything about that, but I'd like to do it just because I want to know how things are going. You won't think as much about that because it's not like a bone marrow biopsy, for instance, where you have to have someone bring you there, you get medications, you have pain for a couple of days, and then you're praying for the right person to do it because you know that if you get Dr. Rex, it's not going to be right. Yeah. And, so, and so what we in BC have done is that because this issue came about, because we used to do it regularly, we had to ask the question as to, is it gonna affect management today? And today, it's probably not gonna change things too much, so we backed off because we used to do it. And particularly because a lot of patients were asking us, do you absolutely have to do this? And you know, you know, physicians sometimes are not as direct with their answers, and I don't know whether you've ever gone to a doc and you've asked a question and he's talked a lot and you walked out saying, I don't know what he said. We can do that. We can talk a lot. We might not be telling you what we're, what we're actually thinking, either because we don't know the answer or because we don't want to give you the answer. But the bottom line is that today, we don't, in, at least in BC, we haven't decided that there's any difference in doing a bone marrow biopsy at that point. If you have a protein that starts at 30 and it goes down to 15, you still have myeloma in your body. What's the bone marrow biopsy going to do for us other than to say, yes, you do have plasma cells there, or no, you don't. And if it, you don't have plasma cells in your bone marrow, are you going to believe me when I say, hey, you know what? You don't have myeloma. And you're going to say, there's protein in my blood, though. So there are certain indications where it might be helpful, but we have to actually think about a fork in the road in terms of how it's going to affect decision if we're going to do an invasive test like a bone marrow biopsy. Now, the other side of it is, too, that there are certain myeloma centers that are very focused on research and this. They want to get samples over time to see what changes in terms of the biology of it. And there are places where to do that. In truth, if you're going to do that, I think you have to be honest to the patient about that, saying that this is not going to lead to any changes right now in terms of your management. But we're going to save it for the future so we can do some research on it. And we're now in a situation, I think, in the current environment where we have to be open and we have to get consent virtually for anything that we do. 
So what I would suggest is that in the, in, the, in the Fred Hutch, I don't really know what they do in terms of management decisions based upon that. The current data that's out there doesn't really seem to imply that it really is going to make a management decision dif difference. I'm not saying that they're doing anything wrong in Seattle. You know, it's, it's just different. And I would tell you that me, if I could, I would love to get a bone marrow sample on you every three months so I could store that in a fridge and get some testing done on that in the future. My problem is, number one, I'm not certain you'd be keen for it. Number two, I need to buy a fridge for that kind of stuff. Number three, I need to have someone smart who's going to do something worthwhile with it because if I'm going to do it to you, you're going to, in the back of your mind, you're saying, this better damn be worth it because they better do, be doing some fancy stuff on this because if they're just storing it in the fridge and not doing nothing with it, then it's a waste of my time and his time. Thank you. For a stem cell transplant? That's a good question. It's a bit of a moving target. Back when we didn't have all these new drugs, you know, we tried to get everybody to a stem cell transplant because we think that made people live longer. With the more modern data, it seems that people don't necessarily live longer, but actually their remissions tend to be longer. So it's still trying to be hashed out. The flip side of it is that I always tell people that if there's any risk, I'm not keen to do it. Because if you die of a transplant, that means you would have lost the opportunity to get all of these other drugs, which would have kept you alive possibly even longer. And on top of that, too, yes, the stem cell transplant costs money. But in Vancouver, when you do it as an outpatient, it probably costs the system about twenty to $30,000, which is about three months of revelment. So it's actually cheaper for us to do more transplants. But on the other hand, if you die from it, you know, you're not going to get all of these wonderful drug development that's going along. So I think it's a bit more fuzzy. We, in general, try to be aggressive as all Canadian centers for people who are relatively well enough to get it. But once you get to a certain point, you know, we back off because we don't want people to have all those problems. And this might go back to your question of, why can't you just do it because I want it? When you're dead, you don't have a second chance. So you kind of, unfortunately, have to you know, ask yourself, do you trust the guy who does it, you know, 50 times a year? Or because the truth is that you could decide that, you know what, the, you know, the guys at my centers, they're too conservative. They don't want to do it to anybody. So I'm going to go to a center that's going to do it. And if you were 75 or 78 years old and you went to some place in America, you could probably get it. Their forces are different than ours and in, in the way our systems work. But, you know, but right now, our current standard is that you, we continue to offer for people who we think will tolerate it well. Uh, um, based up, pardon me? Yeah, yeah. Based upon you know how well they are, um, I hate to admit it. You know, age is not absolute. But the truth is that when you're 75, you're different than when you're 65, which is different than when you're 45. You know, and, and these factor into it too because we're all trying to think about how do we give drugs differently as people get older such that they tolerate it better because quality of life is really important. With that, you know, with that in mind, obviously something like a transplant, we need to be very, very uh, cautious uh, with people as, you know, their health changes when they get older. Other question? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sam. Thank you very much, Dr. Song. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you for coming to Kelowna for this info session. Thank you, to, thank you to all of you for attending this session. And thank you to Ron, who is the marketing guy that did all the promotion for the, for the session. And I really invite you to talk with him to discuss, because he will uh, set up this support group. And I, 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 I truly think that uh, you would benefit from attending uh, those meetings. And now I invite you to have lunch. So we have lunch uh, outside the room, and you can come back in the room to, to, to eat and to discuss uh, together. We're having the room uh, for uh, enough time, so this will allow you to, to have lunch and to discuss uh, together. So thank you again. There are uh, booklets remaining on the table. If you'd like to take some, go ahead and help yourself. And uh, I will leave a number of them with a run if ever you need them uh, in the future. Thank you very much. <laughs>